April 17th City Council meeting. Um, City Council Vice President Jesse Adams, Council President Bill Dwight, Bill Dwight cannot be here tonight. Um, <clears throat> this is the public comment period, which will start now. Uh, it's three minutes that every member of the public has to speak on any issue. Um, we can't answer. Uh, whatever you have to say is not interactive by our rules. And I'd ask you to keep it strictly to three minutes, please. First on the list is going to be Patty Shaughnessy and Crystal Cody. Good evening. I'm Patty Shaughnessy, the director at the Northampton Council on Aging and Senior Center. And this is Crystal Cody Stowe's, our assistant director and also our volunteer coordinator. <clears throat> April has been designated as National Volunteer Month. It is about inspiring, connecting, and encouraging people to seek out imaginative ways to engage in their communities. The many volunteers that we have working at the Northampton Senior Center assist us to meet our challenges and follow through with our mission of serving the seniors of our community. Our volunteers at the Northampton Senior Center fill many needed tasks and without services for our volunteers, we would not be able to offer all that we do offer for opportunities at the Senior Center. Volunteers are the backbone of many organizations and that includes the Senior Center. On Saturday, April 26th, we will be hosting a volunteer recognition breakfast as a thank you to all of our volunteers and all that they accomplished for us. Mayor Narkowitz will be joining us at the recognition breakfast and he will be reading a proclamation from the city of Northampton. The Northampton Senior Center is lucky enough to have over 130 volunteers that dedicate their time to the Senior Center. In Massachusetts, they have dedicated a dollar amount for a volunteer's time, and that dollar amount is $27.43. So that means that our 133 volunteers have helped give $330,000 to the city of Northampton by providing their volunteer services at the Senior Center. Um, that's a total of 12,490.47 hours that they've given to the Senior Center in 2013. And they help out in everything from being board members to bingo, brown bag, cleaning medical equipment, working in our coffee shop, being companions for homebound seniors that can't get out into the community, providing socialization, bringing them to the grocery store, and providing them with medical transportation to doctor's appointments. They really are, as Patty said, the backbone of our senior center, and we are very thankful for them. And so um, this being National Volunteer Month, Though we appreciate volunteers all year long, when you come into the senior center or you're at the hospital or in the schools or wherever you are, thank a volunteer that you see who's there doing the job that they're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Claudia Lefko. Hello, Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. Perhaps some of you saw my letter to the editor in the Gazette today about the uh, crosswalk issue. And I wrote that actually on April 1st, and it was a bit lost in cyberspace. And so in the couple of weeks before they actually put it in the paper, two things happened to me. First, I was reminded by someone that after the Montview neighborhood approached um, the DPW about painting crosswalks, the Center for the Arts um, and the Arts Night Out Coalition, which is all the arts organizations in town, approached the DPW to say they were interested in painting crosswalks in the city. And they made a very specific proposal and they tied it into like basically rather than traffic calming, they tied it into city beautification, a way to bring more people out into the city and so forth. And they had money to do this just like we had money to do this. And again, the DPW said no. So then when I read in the newspaper that somehow the DPW had okayed a project in a crosswalk on Main Street, I was a, I was a annoyed because I thought, well, how come their painting and the crosswalk right on Main Street and these other two proposals were dismissed? So the second thing that happened to me was that Penny Burke, the director of the Center for the Arts, reminded me, and Jesse, this will seem familiar to you, that there's a city ordinance about public art. And in the ordinance, which I have in front of me, uh, it says that it talks about any what is public art, and it says, um, anything except on school property is considered public art by the Arts Council and is reasonably expected to stay no longer than 90 days, shall, be installed, shall not be installed without a permit 
from the Arts Council. So we called the Arts Council and apparently they have not heard anything from the person or the group that proposed painting the rainbow on Main Street. So I'm here to say that somehow this seems very bad, that there's not a process. Like we have a, an ordinance that says they have to go through the Arts Council for the permit, but some people can go to the DPW and get permission to paint. It is a public art project. It might be traffic calming, but it is public art. And I think there has to be some sort of way to determine what is it and where will it go? And I'm not exactly comfortable to have the B DPW be, with all due respect, be the arbiter of public art. I mean, public art projects in this community generate a lot of interest, and I think I'm suggesting you put a stop actually on the sidewalk, on the crosswalk on Main Street, and perhaps refer it to what used to be the art subcommittee of the city council that then became art and recreation, and now I think has like many, many other duties. But I think this needs a process, and I'm here to urge you to like put a little stop on this for now and see if you can't make a process and then let everybody enter fairly into this discussion and be of help to you about how we might proceed with public art in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Jasper Lapiansky. <clears throat> so I'm also speaking about the uh, Rainbow Crosswalk. And what I wanted to speak about was actually I wanted to respond to something that someone said two weeks ago, um, there was a public comment that was uh, somewhat different in style, I think, than, than most of the ones that we're used to. And it said to, the, to a, an effect, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it, to an effect it said that uh, the Rainbow Crosswalk is ideological and political and that should be considered. Um, we're used to taking offense at anything that doesn't fall into a certain category, and the tone was a little bit harsh. But the request was consider whether, not simply whether they should be allowed to do it, but whether they ought to do it. And whether it, Northampton is represented by the rainbow. Despite the tone, I decided to think about it as requested, and I think the answer is yes. I think Northampton is represented by the rainbow. I think we are whether we like it or not, by the way. There's rainbows everywhere in Northampton. If you don't like the rainbow in the crosswalk, fine, but are you gonna go around town eradicating rainbows? Are you gonna take away the Italian flags that have all six colors and say peace in Italian? from the peace activists. Technically, they're doing that on public property. It's about as noticeable. There are probably a thousand other examples of rainbows in Northampton. I happen to think that painting a rainbow crosswalk for gay pride is a really stupid idea. But it's not ideologically wrong. And it's happy and colorful and inclusive. And I don't think that I think the answer to the ideological question is yes. And uh, so if you do decide to consider it in the ideological way, you should consider that it's a good thing to have uh, positive symbols of cultural inclusion in the city. Thanks. Thank you. Kirk Sanger. Hi there, I'm Kirk Sanger. I'm a father of three children that go to Bridge Street School, and we've been parents there for five years now. Um, we just wanted to remind you how important it is to have a brand new playground. Um, the school is fantastic. Inside, teachers are fantastic. The learning that takes place is fantastic. It's the only school downtown that's a public school, um, and it should sort of basically, I think, be sort of the, the pinnacle of what a school looks like, both inside and out, and obviously, Running around is obviously very important for kids to be able to move their bodies and breathe fresh air during the day and not be breathing in sort of parts per million dirt. <laughs> um, so we just wanted to um, basically remind you how important that is. Did you want to say anything, Finn? Yeah. <laughs> no? 
No, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak during public comment? <clears throat> then we'll go into the to the regular meeting, and we'll begin uh, with, an, with the appointment of Pamela Powers to be the, the new clerk of the city council. Um, I'd request a motion for the appointment to that effect. Move to <clears throat> second. Made and seconded. Is there any discussion on this matter? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Now move to the swearing in of, of the new council clerk. Solemnly swear, do solemnly swear to faithfully and impartially to faithfully and impartially discharge the duties, discharge the duties as clerk of the city council, as clerk of the city council, in accordance with the rules and laws of the city of Northampton, in accordance with the rules and laws of the city of Northampton, the constitution of this commonwealth, the constitution of this commonwealth, and the ordinances of the city of Northampton, and the ordinances of the city of Northampton, to the best of my knowledge and ability, to the best of my knowledge and ability. Congratulations, Pamela. <laughs> Thank you. The clerk will call the roll, please. My first official duty here. <laughs> Councillor Adams? Here. Councillor Carney? Present. Councillor Klein? Here. Councillor Labarge? Present. Councillor Murphy? Here. Councillor O'Donnell? Here. Councillor Shura? Here. Councillor Spector? Here. There are no presentations. Uh, there are no public hearings. We do have a communication from the mayor. This communication is in recognition of Arbor Day, which will be April 25th, 2014, from the city of Northampton. Whereas in 1872, a special day was set aside for the planting of trees in Nebraska, which, was, which then was a treeless plain. Today, millions of communities celebrate Arbor Day all over the world. In Massachusetts, we celebrate Arbor Day in our state tree, the elm, on the fourth Friday in April. And whereas trees provide endless benefits, including shade, recreation, food and building products, wildlife habitat, oxygen production, and carbon dioxide uptake, and whereas trees are a renewable resource, giving us paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fires, and countless other wood products, and whereas trees in our city increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of business areas, beautify our community, and, where, and wherever they are planted become a source of joy and serenity, serenity. And whereas rain nourishes the landscape, but as buildings, roads, and parking lots spread and natural tree cover is lost, so is the absorbing effect of vegetation and soil. Rain becomes costly stormwater runoff. Without the benefit of trees and vegetation, waterways are polluted by oils, heavy metal particles, and other harmful substances washing away fish, washing away. Fish and wildlife suffer. Drinking water becomes impossible to reclaim. Property values are reduced and our living environment is degraded. Now therefore, I, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, do hereby proclaim April 25th, 2014 as Arbor Day in the city of Northampton. I urge all citizens to celebrate the day's purpose, support efforts to protect our trees and woodlands, and plant new trees for the well-being of this and future generations. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and affixed the seal of the city of Northampton, David J. Narquitz, Mayor. Is there anyone here to accept this proclamation? No? Okay. <laughs> uh, there are no licenses and petitions. Uh, we'll move to the approval of minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Move of to approve the minutes of April 3rd. Move and second. Is there any discussion on this matter? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, we'll move to reports of committees. Oh, we skipped. I'm sorry, we skipped. Um, are there any one minute announce announcements of events? Councilor Um On uh, Tuesday, April 29th at 7 o'clock, uh, there'll be a forum. Um, to discuss uh, the future of Pleasant Street. Um, it's, it's a forum called Pleasant Futures, <laughs> and it will be held, I wanted to call it Pleasant Dreams, but that was too sleepy, I guess. Mm -hmm. It will be held at 118 Conn Street, uh, again at 7 p.m. April 29th. The address again, I'm sorry. Uh, 118 Conn Street. 
and who involve the Department of Planning and and the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association and local business owners and residents. Everyone's welcome to come share their thoughts. Are there any others? <coughs> Thank you. Um, we do have one appointment. New appointment to the Planning Board, Teresa Perone poe term March 2014 through March 2019 to replace Jennifer Derringer, whose term expired in March 2014. Um, is there a motion to refer Move to the- to refer to rules, orders, appointments, and ordinances. Second. Is there any discussion on this matter? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? We'll now recess for the Finance Committee. Mm -hmm. Pam, would you call the roll for finance? Yeah. Here. Councillor Adams? Here. Councillor Lobard? Present. Councillor Sierra? Here. Excellent. The first uh, agenda item tonight is a report from Scanlon Associates. Mr. Scanlon is here and completed the audit of 2013. And if you'll approach and uh, go through your presentation for us. Sounds good. Thank you. Hope I only have three minutes, do I? <laughs> oh, you do <laughs> Ten. <laughs> Uh, so I've got a PowerPoint uh, presentation for you. I figured I'd step it up a notch. Um, <laughs> I want that light off over here? Would that help? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that'd be nice. That should go off. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Wayne. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Tom Scanlon, Jr. I'm the managing partner of Scanlon Associates. Um, and I brought Jeff Gendron with me tonight, who was the audit manager in charge of uh, <laughs> the audit. Um, so the two biggest lies in auditing are the client, it's great to see you, and the auditor, we're here to help. Um, <laughs> but from our firm approach, we like to uh, close that gap. Um, so we feel the audit is a year-round process. It's not just a two, three-week thing and we're out. We say, this is what you did wrong, and we're gone. So we like to close that gap. We are here to help, but we don't want to be relied upon either of on your controls. So I think that's something to point out. Uh, putting uh, Pam to the test here tonight, going backwards. I don't know why it's going to the first one. That was great. Thanks. That was, was, it good? That was a good one. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. I do something. <laughs> uh, so what's the point of an audit? Uh, it really just focuses on your financial statements. Uh, the objective of an audit is to opine on your financial statements. It's only a backhanded level of assurance on your internal controls, and I don't mean that literally we don't backhand you, uh, but we're expressing no opinion on your internal controls. It's really we're designing our, our audit procedures by doing a risk assessment. Um, it also keeps the management team motivated throughout the year. If you feel like your know, control doesn't work, hopefully management says, oh, we got these auditors coming in. I better do this. Um, and also satisfies bond disclosures out there and A133 requirements, which is a single audit. And also ensures public and management confidence that your controls are working. Um, our next slide. Can't be falling asleep up there. <laughs> um, I would like to point out what the independent auditor's responsibility is. Um, we have a plan to perform the audit to obtain reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free of material misstatement, whether caused from error or fraud. The sole objective is not to find fraud. Um, and I know there's an expectation gap between the client and the auditor. Um, everyone associates the word with audit with fraud, and that's not the purpose. It's a risk-based approach. Uh, we assess risk on your financial statements, and a part of that risk is, fr is the fraud risk. So we're designing our procedures with that incorporated, and we're looking for material fraud. But that is not the sole objective of it. Um, and I always like to point that out, because um, I know there's a big expectation gap between client and what the audit actually does. So with that kind of being said, we'll jump right in. You should have three reports in front of you um, or on your computer with technology these days. Uh, the first one, the thicker one, we're going to go through, and then we're going to go through uh, the single audit, which is uh, compliance requirements um, of federal funds, and then 
the one that everyone looks forward to is the management letter. Um, so the basic financial statements, some of uh, the general highlights that I'm going to point out. Um, if there's any questions as we go, please stop and ask, uh, ask them to me. Um, I just want to focus on key ones I think are important through it. Um, the city received an unmodifi unmodified opinion, which is the best opinion a municipality can get um, in accordance with GAP. And again, that was our sole objective to do that, so the city should be congratulated on that. Uh, the first two statements kind of want to hit on pages 12 and 13 of the report. These are what we call entity-wide statements. Um, they focus more kind of get in line with the private sector with a company. They have on there, it takes on the whole economic resource measurement focus, which is takes into account your fixed assets, depreciation, your long-term debt, your OPEB liabilities, your compensated absences. So that's what these first two statements are looking at. And some of the general highlights uh, on the page in 12 and 13 um, that kind of stand out at you. The next slide. Uh, you see your OPEB liability, it's at approximately 25, approaching 26 million. I know we've talked about that liability in the past and what OPEB stands for is other post-employment benefits, which is mainly your health insurance. It's just the promises you made to your employees at a given point in time, you're going to pay them. Um, back in 2009, GASB required that to be on your financial statements, which the city did. Um, you can see it's growing about 7.7 .7 million a year. You're not alone in that. Um, every municipality across the country is facing that. You're on a pay-as-you-go basis. And one of the things we talked about was adopting a trust to fund it. Um, and I, as, as we speak in 2013, the city does not have a trust that's funded. Somewhere near lies the truth. Uh, I know it's not zero dollars, but I'm not too sure it's 25 million either. Um, there's a lot of assumptions based into there. But again, I, I put OPEB in a category of when it first came out is who's doing it, who's measuring it, who's putting it on their financial statements. The city did. Um, now we're kind of in the area of what are you doing about it. Um, the city passed some laws, you know, um, addressed some their plan design. Um, and now I think the next step is how are you going to fund it. So I think that's one thing going forward is uh, come up with a plan on how to fund it. Um, and again, if you look at your unrestricted governmental funds, it's a negative 15.5 million. You never want to see negatives on your statement of net position. The direct result of that is your OPEB liability and your compensated absences. You're going to pay as you go as you go on that. Um, so there's no assets up above, where if you have debt, the corresponding asset is up above. So typically, most communities I do, I do approximately about 80 municipalities. We specialize in them. Um, they're all in the negative net position. So we have about five to six communities that are funding their OPEB to an amount that is realistic. They're not just sticking $10,000 into a trust. You know, they're attempting to fund 10 to 30 percent of their ARC. You know, the city would have to fit $7.7 .7 million into their budget, which I'm assuming that's not a possibility at this point in time. Um, but again, it's just getting you thinking about that you are making promises out there. And that's what these first two statements kind of do. It's over your time when you're making promises and you're not funding them, you're going to see the decrease on your net position. So on page 13, you'll see the net position decreased in the governmental activities, 2.5 million. And you'd expect to see it decrease 7.7 .7 million because you're not funding it. Um, however, this takes into account capital assets and depreciation. So you purchased $8 million that you expense on your governmental, but over time, the 4.6 we're only hitting on this statement because it's factoring in depreciation. So those two net out to the bulk of $2.5 million. Most municipalities are going to see a decrease on this statement. That's why I don't want you to get too excited because of the OPEB and the compensated absences. So I think those are two kind of statements I just want to point out because most people look at that and say, oh, she's we're in a negative why, and that is why. Okay. 
Uh, the next statements kind of want to focus is on on pages 14 and 15 and 18. And these are your statements where the bond companies are really focusing on, um, where management should focus on. It takes into account uh, the current economic resources, which is your debt payments are in here, not depreciation. What you're collecting is recognized as revenue as opposed to the first statement we're on, which you bill out is being recognized as revenue. So these are more traditional. You'll see on the statements on pages 14 and 15, they're broken out between major funds and non-major funds. There's certain criteria that meet into major funds. It's the general fund, which is the city's main operating fund, will always be a major fund. It will be always in a separate column. And then you have the police construction facility, which is just, it didn't meet the criteria, but it piques public interest. That's why we showed it has a major fund. The non-major funds, for anyone that's interested, uh, is, is broken down on pages 59 through 62. And what they compromise of is your grants, your revolving funds, your capital projects, and your trusts. I always encourage uh, management to look at that just to see what they have out there in those funds. Just go through it. Maybe something might pique their interest. Um, you'll see that the fund balances are broken down between non-spendable, restricted, assigned, and unassigned. Um, and Back in 2011, GASB um, defined fund balance in different criteria, and that's a level of constraints. Restricted would mean any outside granting agency gives you money, it would be restricted. National law revolving funds is governed by a, a law outside of the city, so it would be under restricted. Assigned would be your encumbrances, which is at your department head level. You vote a budget, they didn't spend the money by the end of the year. They obligated, though, with a purchase order, so that number would be under assigned and unassigned would be the net residual value that's not restricted to anything what gasby 54 did um, was put your stabilization fund under your general fund so that's one thing when you look at unassigned you see it at 5.6 million the city's free cash is only 3.2 what that difference is is your stabilization funds are now recognized under the general fund uh, so i think that's one thing i wanted to point out and on page 15, you'll see that's your operating um, statement. <coughs> and you'll see the general fund, I always like to point out, the $2.1 million increased by. That is a focus of um, bond companies. And I just like to point out that that change is, since stabilization fund is part right. of the general fund, every time there's a net increase in um, the stabilization fund, your your total fund balance is going to go up. Uh, you're able to generate an extra $400,000 in your free cash. And also what plays a role in that is your difference in encumbrances. Your encumbrances from last year to this year, which is fund balance, uh, increased a million dollars. So, and it has to do with your capital. So you voted them in in 2013, but you didn't actually spend the money. So it's part of your fund balance. So going into next year, we'd expect to see a decrease. Um, and with governments, unlike a business, decreases should get you excited, um, gets bonding coming second, but the reason for them is it's one-time things. So even though you look at it from a company perspective, you look at the private sector, say, oh, 2.1, we're doing really good. You are, but a component of that of roughly about a million dollars has to do with encumbrances. Um, so your actually total fund balance in theory went up about 1.1 million is the total increase in stabilization and you to generate free cash um, and then go back one side yeah there you go so your free cash um, was certified by uh, uh, back two slides go backwards yeah there you go uh, so your free cash was uh, certified at 3.2 I always like to go over where free cash comes from because I think it's a component um, that City Council you're voting um, on it and the use of it and I always like kind of go over that with management. And if you go to page 18, and this is probably the key statement, um, any government is your budget versus actual. And we can kind of see how we laid out um, on the slide for you that on your appropriations, you're turning back about 1.7 million, and that generates free cash. So you're establishing a budget, uh, departments are 
spending them or encumbering them at year's end, which if you go look at the um, statement, you'll see the final budget was 81 million. That includes prior year encumbrances. And then the third column is what actually happens, actually spent and actually received. Uh, and the fourth column is the encumbrances. So it's the piece that you're encumbering from one year to the next. And as we talked about, your encumbrances increased. You can see if you just look at capital improvements for a minute, the original budget, that 1.3, that was what came forward from your 12 budget into your 13. And at year's end, you're encumbering 2.6. So if you're going to spend the 2.6 in 2014, we'd expect to see your fund balance decrease 2.6 because it's sitting in the beginning fund balance. So I always think that's important to point out when bonding companies or the management looks to see, oh, if we decreased, we must have did bad. And then not always equated like in a company. Um, so when you look at your appropriations, 1.7 million. More than half is what's generating your free cash there. So you're getting your free cash off return of appropriations. Um, when you look at it shows good management oversight. Um, as part of management, they're watching their budgets. They're, they're making sure departments just aren't spending their money because they have a surplus at year's end. Um, so that's encouraging to see as the governing board as you look at this statement. Because um, I have plenty of clients out there where it shows $100 left over at the end of the year. And your free cash is being generated off return of appropriations. And then if you go up, up to the top half, which is um, your state and local receipts, <coughs> you're generating about 835000 which is good. You're conservative on your receipts. Um, and as we look at those individual categories, if you look at charges for services, that's ambulance and parking. Um, you look at the statement. And then license permits and fees two big components of uh, that is uh, school tuition, the Smith Road tuition, and uh, parking tickets. Yeah. So you, you have a nice blend on that statement of your revenues. You're very conservative. So when you're conservative on your revenues, when you set them to an appropriate level, and you set your budget off of that, any excess that comes in, it's free cash. So again, if you're going to increase your estimates on your local receipts, you're going to lose the free cash. Um, so I think it's very... I don't know where it's coming from. Um, so I think we laid it out uh, right there for you. Do you have any questions? Well, I mean, uh, um, so you talked about the variance um, for the unencumbered yep. uh, funds. And so for, I'm looking at the line for investment income, then it shows a $40,000 negative. That, does that mean that we had a decrease in our investment well, income? Well, it just means what you budgeted. You budgeted 133000 for your investment income. Okay. Um, and you know the markets haven't been the best in the world. Right. So, uh, that so that's very common in the last two years seeing negatives in there. Okay. So and, and again, when you go into 2014, you're taking that into account, so you're reducing that. Okay. So when we look at local receipts, we kind of take anything under intergovernmental is really a local receipt. So mm -hmm. as long as you have you don't have negatives in every category, um, but you have a nice blend. You're not you don't have one-time things off of there that's generating it, which is Would good that be to the see. Same thing for the interest then that it was against an, a, a, an estimate, and that's yeah. why it shows up in the in the Correct. Okay. Yes. And then on the next slide, uh, we kind of put your last five years of free cash and stabilization funds there. Um, cause these are your two main reserves. As you can see, your, your free cash has been going up. Um, back in 2012, Approximately about 1.2 of that 2.8 was one-time events. Um, about 850,000 closing out of ambulance surplus, which is a one-time thing, and then get a bond premium of about 375. So of the 2.8, 1.2 of that, um, again a one-time event that happened. So, and we jump up 3.2, we see the city starting to line their budget um, pretty accordingly, and I think you have a great plan put together. And establishing reserves and establishing the budget, and you also have a plan on utilizing on establishing stabilization funds. Uh, when bond companies look at you out there, this is what they're looking at. Um, so I think that chart jumped out at us while we were auditing, um, and I've talked to uh, your management about it. So, as an outside person coming and looking at your finances, I like what I see. Um, bond companies are too. So. 
Yeah. Well, just that one-time event that you're referring to is mm -hmm. actually the um, the override, that piece of the override that took a portion and put that into stabilization. That's 2014, I believe. That's kicking in. Oh. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, so that's not reflected. That's here. not even reflected in these. So you're even going to see that even more. Okay. And again, all these things that you're doing, and this is this plan you have. The bond companies are looking at you differently. It's in a good way. Um, reserves are great. Um, and I know there's a defined blend between overtaxing and establishing reserves. Um, I think you're, you're right on target with what you're doing. You can see back in 2009, 2010, you don't want to be there. I mean, 2009 was, was a tough year, you could see. Um, so if you do the next, uh, it comes things out, free cash. Free cash, you know, is considered a non-reoccurring type available fund. So you want it, when you use it, you want to use it for non-reoccurring events or having a nice blend of it, which I think the city's getting on track to with their budgets. Um, you should strive to generate three to five percent in your budget. That's a general recommendation. Your your budget, the first goal, the first one you adopted um, at the beginning of the year, not without transfers at the end. This box about seventy-five million. That's really your operating budget. So three to five percent will put you about two point two to three point seven. So you're right in that category. Um, then we kind of listed down your reserves to look at them. So what the bond companies uh, are looking at you yeah, and your total reserves. And we threw a parking res reserve in there, about six point one. Sound when you go out there and get a bond rating, they're looking at ten percent as sound reserves. Um, you're roughly about eight percent of your total budget. So again, you're going in the right track. Um, I like to keep on encouraging that. I know it's easy for me to say to build your reserves, um, but they do go a long way when it comes into emergencies. Um, and also, we bond. when you go out into the bond market, you're getting reflected in the bond rating. Okay. Um, some other key financial uh, highlights I just like to point out is, you know, your, really your two key revenue sources are your property tax and state receipts. So and anything you do that's significant in building reserve is going to come from the tax or it come from state receipts. So as state receipts go down, so might your budget too or so might your reserves. And that's the importance of reserves. When your state has a bad year, you can fund it, back fund it with, you know, stabilizations that you build up. Um, yep. Yes, on the property taxes, yep. because I know that for several years we have had difficulties where some people could not pay their taxes. Mm -hmm. Do you have that total? Uh, yeah, I'm actually going to get that to one of the slides. Okay. Because it's something you should be proud of, actually. <laughs> um, and on the expenditures, I always think it's the categories. Yeah, I see education, employees, benefits, that's 50% of your budget. Um, public safety up there, too. The debt service, I always like to point out. Usually, debt service, we see 5 to 6% of your budget uh, without debt exclusions. The city does have a debt exclusion, so we expect to see that in the 8 to 10 percent category so you're right there with your debt if you didn't have a debt exclusion eight percent um i'd probably encourage you to have one <laughs> actually so mm -hmm. everything's kind of falling in line but i think it's always important to know when you look at your when you're setting your budget property taxes 60 percent and intergovernmental 20 percent so those are your big chief um resources uh next slide is on pages 63 and 65. Um, we laid out in our report. Your key accounts receivable. And I think what you see is, um, you know, your property tax collection rate is 97%. And all that is, all we take that calculation is, um, <coughs> Collections divided by the commitment just for the current year. 97% is really good. Um, usually, like, see, communities are usually at 92 to 95. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're sh throwing everything into tax title. The city here, their tax title is at 411,000. That's good. Um, that's extremely low for a city your size. So, what that's telling us is you're collecting your taxes. Uh, some of the things we don't like to see is if you're down below 92, you're 89%, and your tax title is not growing. And that, that's the key for us that something's wrong, um, something's going on, and you don't have that. Um, so I think that's what you were kind of referring to. Um, 
And again, as you look, there's minimal to no variances between the detail and the general ledger. Which, yep. And also the, the column on abatements and adjustments, is, is that comparatively low to others? Because it's 130,000 yes. out of yes. 45 million? Yes, that's low compared to your commitment. Yeah. Yeah, no, you'd, and that would stand out in your collection, right? You know, if you were billing in your commitment and you were misbilling, lack of a better term, um, you'd have to have abatements or your outstanding list would grow, so your collection rate would be dropping. So that, that's right on, I mean, it's above average when we're taking them. <coughs> um, we usually see 92 to 95 percent. So you can tell, I know she's sitting behind me, you can tell your collector's doing um, her job. Uh, and you can also tell that the finance team's doing their job too by balancing out the ledger when you see minimal variances. That means your controls are working. You know, this is the detail, the actual detail list, and that's balancing out to the ledger. That's why you have segregation of duties. You have a city auditor who's maintaining the ledger and then the collector who's collecting the asset. So you want to see them balancing out, which you are. So I think that schedule is very important to point out. The only thing, and I am an auditor and I always see the pessimist uh, on the side of it is you do have older tax accounts receivable out there um, personal property and more vehicle you go back a ways and their problem accounts um, unfortunately the other way with personal property you have to write off you have to write off through your overlay so again we're encouraged the city to work on writing those off um, you're not gonna, in my opinion you're not going to collect them um, it's just a matter of doing the formal process going through Again, a motor vehicle, you live in a college community, someone registers a car here, they're out, they're outstanding. Uh, you do have a procedure where you mark them at the registry, but if you know they're out in East Utah, I don't think they're going to come back to Northampton to pay their 1988 motor vehicle bill. Uh, <laughs> I mean, but you are marked at the registry, so if they ever do come back in Massachusetts, which, which I have seen, I've seen a $5 motor vehicle excise bill turn into $480. Um, so you, you are marking, you are doing those procedures. Uh, but again, we just like to clean up the books just to uh, show it. There is a line there on rollback taxes. It's very small, but is there, is there, what is the rollback tax? Rollback taxes, if you're in uh, 61A, um, which is farmland, and you come out of it, you're, you have to, I don't know how the term rollback, I'm just assuming this is how it came about. It rolls back three years. You have to go back and pay that difference in tax between what you were in and what you were taxed at. Again, I think you have a balance coming in. I think it's just it, you really it, you, you're leaned at the registry, so you always have an automatic lien on that. Thanks. So those are kind of the key basic financial statements. I just want to hit with you um, again after you have a chance to read if you have any more questions. Don't hesitate. Call me. Contact me. Um, the next report uh, is the single audit report. And I usually just like to touch base on that, what it is. Is if a municipality expends over 500000 in federal funds, you have to do a thing called a single audit. It's compliance driven, um, all in accordance with grants. The city expended $4.2 in federal awards in fiscal year 13. Uh, and the rules are we have to test at least 50% of those grant awards in accordance with um, the compliance supplement put out by the various granting agencies. So the grants we tested uh, with education grants, they were special ed in Title I. They were approximately 927000 And community development, uh, $1.4 million. And we had no findings, uh, which is always a good thing. How do you, maybe you say this. How do you determine which grants to test? Uh, you have to cover the 50% rule. So as a matrix, what we do, um, I don't want to get too technical on you, but they're considered major programs. So anything over 300000 is considered a major program. And you have to test their major program once out of the three years. Okay. So once you define the major programs, then you have non-major programs, and then you assess risk on the major programs and non-major programs, and then you have to cover 50%. So you test the high-risk grants. Okay. So yeah, it's kind of a, if you saw the matrix, you'd probably get dizzy. I mean, <laughs> anything the federal government trying to make it come down. Um, but again, I think it's important to know that, you know, the federal grants are being tested uh, coming through the system. And then the management letter, which uh, I know everyone likes to uh, talk about. Uh, I know it's usually a focus of, of everyone. 
involved. Kind of, uh, you know, put some viewpoints with the audit. He thinks, you know, why is the auditor so picky? Uh, I'm going to get fired because I didn't cross my T here. Uh, and sometimes, you know, when we're out there doing the audit, we do make the client kind of feel like the guy in the left uh, pulling his hair out. Um, what we see with the management letter is, you know, adding value um, and accountability to the governing board um, as we go through and look that you want to make sure your controls are being, which, what your assertions are being made. We know, hey, we want our cash balance. We want our account receivable. That's what we're telling our constituents out there. So that's what we have going through the management letter. I know, um, I know sometimes uh, it's always a, you never see anything good in a management letter. It's always uh, criticisms, we'll say. So, uh, again, the management letter, there was uh, no material weaknesses and no significant deficiencies, which is good. Uh, we only had other matters, which we had four current comments. Uh, one of them is to adopt a reserve fund for compensated absences, which you did at the first part of this fiscal year in 14. Again, that's another reserve we talked about. Uh, the city's compensated about 3.5 million. That's good to see. Uh, we like that. And, uh, you know, I encourage, uh, that's a good job for adopting that. Uh, which more of my clients would adopt that section of the law. Uh, health insurance withholding, uh, through our testing, tax uh, withholdings uh, change where they had to report your health insurance on the W-2s. That was a tricky administrative burden that happened uh, in most communities was how do I get the two pieces onto the W-2 without going in and manually put them on. So a lot of accounts were created um, and what happened is a lot of links where it was hitting pair withholdings twice. I know it, I, it, the first time we found it, and it was the next 40 in a row, anyone that had mutinous kind of had the same finding you see in the management report. Again, it was more reviewing it. Um, we probably would like to see management catch that um, on their basis. But again, they, they, we went over it with them. They addressed it, and they, they rectified the situation. Third comment uh, we have is encumbrances. You know, we talked about that earlier. Encumbrances. Uh, Trying to rush me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry, uh, page. Encumbrances, and what encumbrances is, you vote uh, a budget. At the end of the year, you have to have some kind of obligation in place, a PO, a contract, or some commitment to spending the money. Uh, during our testing, um, we'd probably like to see the control picked up a little bit in that regards. Um, and again, we talked about it with. Uh, your finance team, uh, they, they understood and they were going to put controls for this year in closing to review the controls uh, on the encumbrances on a little more tighter basis. Again, I think that's more being more picky oon than uh, an actual problem, but again, I usually have the model, I like to stay ahead of the barking dogs. Um, so <coughs> our fourth comment is Gatsby 65 and 68, just when you thought there could be no more Gatsby's, we've got another one coming down the line. Uh, the most important one there is Gatsby 68, <coughs> and it has to do with pensions. Um, as you all know, Detroit, I'm sure they still exist, but they went some fin financial difficulties, came back to their pensions, um, and Massachusetts measures their pensions the same way as Michigan measured their pensions. So Gatsby 68 came out. There's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of things to kind of sort out with this Gatsby. There's a lot of conflicting, um, how is it going to be measured? There's two years, we have 2015 financial statements before we have to put it on. So we're encouraging the city to attend as much informational sessions you can get to. Uh, I believe the city should be all right in that regards because of the way I read it, if uh, your pension system is somewhere around 62 to 65 percent funded, you should have an asset on your books, uh, which I believe the Northampton retirement system is. So it's just a matter of getting the GASB, learning it, and how to implement it onto your financial statements. That's going to be the complexities for Northampton. Again, we don't want to see no delays in issuing of your financial statements because you do have a March 31st deadline to submit. Um, and I see a, a mess coming up on the horizon with all this. Um, and, and talking with your actuary, because really, in, in, in essence, you have to have two actuarial studies. 
one to come up with your arc, which you're doing now to fund it, and then another one to come up with an amount to put on your financial statements. So they, they look at it in different ones prospectively and ones retroactively. Um, so there's going to be a lot of complexities with that. So hopefully a lot of it will be worked out over the time. So I figured two years down the road uh, give us enough time to work it out. Um, some of our prior year uh, other matters, uh, we talked about the older accounts receivable. Um, but one area was bank account reconciliations. Last year when we went and tested them, we saw some issues that should have cleared up that affected the ledger. Um, I believe we approached that, but subsequent to our audit field work, um, subsequent to year end, you had a change in personnel. That was key personnel. Uh, you are a small office in there. Um, and the bank reconciliations got behind, and when we say behind, excess of 30 days. Um, and that's such a key control um, to it. Again, we trusted with management, and management is was on top of it and is addressing the situation. Uh, but we encourage, which I don't think will be an issue. I believe management uh, is good in that regards. So, and, I, and that's one thing I would like to point out. In prior years, we had management had comments to you about assessing <coughs> your internal controls and monitoring your risk. You are doing that. You're one of the few communities that do that. Um, you're very, you're proactive. Um, when you're looking for things. So, I mean, that's one thing I'd like that should be congratulate your financial team that you're definitely, you don't sit back and, okay, let's wait for something to happen. I think you're constantly researching, which is a tough job. I mean, you've got a $75 million budget, you've got complexities all over the place. Municipal finance has changed so much in the past 10 years. I mean, I started 22 years ago. It was, my audit program was four pages, and now it's 72 pages. Um, so, with programs, so I, city does an excellent job in assessing their risk and monitoring their controls. Um, and I think that's just about it, and the big question mark comes up. Questions next. for Mr. Scanlon? Mm -hmm. okay. I actually have a question it's for the finance director about um, num number four in the management letter. And I was just curious that in um, well, the recommendation is to centralize the process of, re of review and compliance with various grants, bonds, and other sources of funding. Oh, that's, and that's prior years? That was prior years, management point four? Okay, so the city's response is to take it under advisement. And I'm curious as to what level of consideration we gave to that. Right. We, we don't have any one department that's kind of responsible for reviewing all of the different grants that various departments get us involved with. Um, some of the more complex ones have been the QECB and the CREB funding that we did that was part of the energy conservation and there's some very specific requirements there that and then the, of course the CDBG and then there's fire department grants so right now we rely on the department manager to be the one that basically makes sure that we're complying with all of the requirements of that grant. Um, it's something that we need to perhaps more centralize. We haven't gotten to that point. We haven't got another one person assigned to this because it's a pretty big job because it's basically trying to figure out all of that fine print that's in every um, contract that we sign with an, a governmental agency. So I can't say that we've made tremendous progress on this, but we know we need to. Um, with Krebs and QECBs, I've gotten involved in that just because we had certain funding uh, deadlines that we had to have that money spent by so we got more involved in looking at that one than some of the other ones but we know we need to do a better job at this um, we just haven't figured out how we're going to do that and, you know we have all the school grants too so it's kind of like there's no one on the municipal side who's going to be able to kind of get into all the school grants so we're just trying to sort that out right now thank you mm -hmm. just uh, a couple questions with regards to one of the first thing you talked about, yep. which was our accounting for and funding our future health care liabilities. And I remember when that first came out, and then we were all aghast by that, and now yep. we have pensions coming too. There was some talk about the state actually setting up a form of trust fund for municipalities so that we could pool our efforts to do that, mm -hmm. uh, because we, we, every community in Massachusetts probably has that problem. 
and to come up with a joint solution where we could set up a trust for that and fund it mm -hmm. and it would cover us. Has the state made any progress on that? I think the state, the state passed um, Chapter 32B, Section 20, which it localized it, which said each local community can adopt its own trust and keep the funds at, at their okay. level. Right. Um, so that's why I, that's the section that I would encourage on adopting. Uh, very good. And the state had the same problem we did. Yep. Did they deal with it? You know, I, I, mm -hmm. I believe they are funding it. I would have to look at their financial standards, but I, I believe, yeah. I mean, everyone has the same. Everybody, every governmental entity has the same issue with this accounting. <laughs> and, and, and somewhere in there lies the truth. It is a promise that you, that you made. Um, it, it, yeah, everyone's in the same boat. I know, I know there's different... There's different theories on it. Uh, Connecticut, um, which I can get some information on, Connecticut, for any new hires, um, they're doing a, a surcharge onto the new hire. So I think it's 3 or 5% of their pay, which they're not taxed on, so it's deferred. Um, they take and they put it into a trust, and I believe the state matches it. So, and then at the end of 10 years, that salary comes, gets restored back to the employee. So any new hires, they're assessing right off the bat. I mean, that's one way to kind of fight it. For those individuals, yeah, okay. but not for the existing employees. Not for existing. I guess the, the hope there is you hope they exterminate <laughs> down the <line. laughs> Well, thank you. I'm very pleased because I remember, you know, there were some pretty serious issues in the management letter we were getting five or six years ago. Oh yeah, yeah. And it's cleaned up very nicely, I think. So. Yes, so you're definitely going in the right direction. So, thank you. Any other questions, for Mr. Scanlon? Thank you for any time for your report and the upgrade to PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And if there's any questions throughout the year, don't hesitate to contact our office and any concerns. Hopefully, I'll bring all my mess with me. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, no Thank problem. You. All right. And now we have, um, we're done with our audit, we have some financial orders. The first one um, is to reprogram $13,677.51 from Jackson Street Schools tile to library air conditioning. And do we can we have an order for that? There we go. So I'll uh, read the order. Whereas the city of Northampton appropriated $75,000 for the replacement of asbestos tile at Jackson School in 2011, and whereas there is a balance of funds remaining from the project of $13,677.51. And it's the mayor's intention to reprogram this remaining balance for other capital needs, whereas there is an identified need to provide air conditioning and library space. And whereas Jackson Street School is the only school building in the district without air conditioning or ceiling fans in the library to provide a cooling space and funds would be used for equipment <coughs> and labor uh, that would be provided by Central Services, HVAC, and electrical staff. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $13,677.51 be reprogrammed from the balance of the Jackson Street School Tile Replacement Project for the purpose of providing air conditioning in the library at Jackson Street School. Motion in finance? I'll move to send this forward to the full City Council with a positive recommendation. Second. Okay. All right. Any more discussion? Um, I see Mr. Pomerantz is here. Do, do we want to speak uh, to Mr. Pomerantz about this? Move to recognize Mr. Pomerantz. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. You're on, Mr. Pomerantz. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Good evening, Councilors. Uh, briefly, uh, as the order is written, we have money left from an extensive flooring project we did at Jackson Street over the last two or three years. Um, Principal Gwen Agna has for years been trying to get air conditioning into the library at the school. Uh, so on really hot days in the spring once, and I'm sure it'll happen this spring once winter disappears, uh, on extremely hot days they can bring the children into the library as almost a cooling center. Uh, we have uh, exactly the amount, right amount of money left over in the flooring account to move over and do this air conditioning project. And basically the money would be used to purchase materials Labor would come from my staff uh, to do the installation. And uh, this is the only air conditioning project we're doing in the building, just the library. And uh, it would bring all the elementary schools pretty much up to snuff as far as having some space that's air conditioned for uh, on specifically hot days. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Barge. 
Um, I see on here it does state that Ryan Rose does not have air conditioning, but they use the ceiling fans. That's correct. Can you explain what would the difference be between the air conditioning and the ceiling fans? I'm it, just looking health-wise because when you have children out in the hot weather coming in, no air conditioning, mm -hmm. I mean, ceiling fans don't <clears throat> solve that problem. Not like air conditioning. That's correct. The ceiling fans at Ryan will basically move the air around, and by opening the perimeter doors, they are bringing in at least they're moving the air through the library. It is not air conditioning. That's true. So obviously, the intent at some point we did work in the perimeter rooms at the library a number of years ago to basically deal with ventilation issues there. We still need to address the library. But at least they have some system in place to move the air. Well, at Ryan that, I hope that's also looked at too because yeah. I think with um, what is going on here with the Jackson Street School I am really happy that this is going to happen there because some of the children who have allergies and so forth and they're out in that hot weather and coming into a school building that has no circulation of air is not healthy. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I'll just note is that we're, uh, we're ask I'm asking for two readings on this tonight uh, because we'd like to get this done in the next couple of weeks uh, before the hot weather does set in. Any other questions in finance or from any other councilors? No? Then uh, all in, in finance, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Positive? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Thank Councilors. you. Thank you. Uh, then the next order is for the Bridge Street School Playground. Okay. Oh, no, for the order. Yeah. The, the Bridge Street. Yeah. Thank you. Upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee, order that whereas the Bridge Street School submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding to re rehabilitate the school's playground and whereas the project will provide funding for design and construction costs to rehabilitate the school playground so that the school, its neighbors, and the city visitors will have a healthy, sustainable playground and whereas the school department will be required to find a snow storage location that will not damage the playground and will not make it unsafe throughout the year, and whereas the school department shall use its best efforts to coordinate with DPW and other city departments to ensure that crosswalks leading to the playground and school are properly signed and painted and maintained so as to properly serve its function and uh, that they'll work with the DPW and the Department of Recreation to assess whether additional crosswalks are necessary given increased neighborhood activity anticipated from both the playground and the proposed improvements to the adjacent Lamprin Park. And whereas the school department will coordinate with the city's Department of Recreation in an effort to install <coughs> complementary improvements to Lamprin Park. And whereas on April 2nd, 2014, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $165,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $165,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Bridge Street School Playground Rehabilitation and that the grantees meet conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council. Specifically, $165,000 is appropriated from the CPA Budget Reserve. Move to send it forward to the full city council. Second. 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 All right. And any questions? Uh, and who's, to, um, come on up. Sarah LaValle. And Sarah's here to speak. Second. Uh, she's the coordinator with the CPC committee. So we'll have a bunch of questions on this. So please, any questions for Sarah? Yes. Council of March. Um, Sarah, there was, um, I, I'm supporting this 100%. There's no question about this. But can you explain the process of that playground? What had happened here where many of the parents got together through the PTO and there was a lot of concerns about health conditions in that playground? Can you talk about that? Uh, as we heard from the, the project applicants at the, at, at the school, it's a really dusty playground. It's, it was beaten up for a lot of years and really just wasn't usable. And, and it, teachers also yeah. were complaining and can you talk about the process, about the windows and so forth, how it actually affected 
that they could not open the windows, they had to keep them closed? Yeah, I, it, it was so bad that not only was the playground impacted, but during the warmer months when you'd want to open the windows and get some outside air and it was so dusty that a lot of times the school wouldn't be able to. So there was a concern of health issues, correct? Yes, definitely. And the playground area itself is used not just by Bridge Street School, but many people throughout the city and around the neighborhoods do use that playground just like we do at Ryan Road School, correct? Yes, it's definitely a, a center of the neighborhood that gets a lot of use. Okay, so you can start talking about the process. Um, there are, the applicant is also here and they, they've been involved in a lot longer than I have, so they may be better equipped to speak to that. And no. there, through the CPA, wasn't there a question about they put some restrictions in regards to because there's always this huge mound of snow in the back? Yeah, these, these conditions that you see in the council order um, typically would just be included in the contract with, with the applicant. Mm -hmm. But as a result of some comments that we had during the last round and counselors wanted to see more detailed orders, we in included them in the, in the financial order here. Now, re recent changes in the CPC legislation at the state level now make us able to use those funds for existing facilities like this playground? That is correct. Um, so we, we, in the beginning, we couldn't do this, but now we can. No, you could, previously could only use CPA funds for brand new playgrounds. Yeah, I support this. I, I had a, I, I spoke with um, Downey Meyer on Sunday about all these order, orders, and what, just something small I wanted to point out was that um, in, in the in the third, fourth, and fifth, whereas we required the school department to do certain things, and I don't believe we can mandate them to do certain things. I believe they're outside of our jurisdiction. Um, Mr. Meyer told me that he would follow up this, with the solicitor on that. Um, are you aware if he did? If if not, could you just see if we can get that straightened out by second reading? That I'm I'm not aware of, but these conditions would be imposed on applicants by the committee anyway, in contracts. So it's not really the city council um, telling the, the school department that they have to do something. It's the the committee as a grantee, as a grantor, telling them that, that they have to do that. Well, I, I understand, but it, it's a it's a council order. So mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I if it, so I I, I would request that you ask that question to the solicitor if, if you okay you I can check on that and an as an alternative we also could just strike that from the order if, if the council doesn't want to vote on it this way no, no it, I mean I don't yeah. think it arises to that level we'll just, yeah. before we do second read. right we could do that second reading. any other questions on this one for Sarah then uh, all in favor and find yes please say aye. 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 aye aye any opposed And uh, we have another playground. Upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee, order that whereas the Northampton Recreation Department and the Northampton Office of Planning and Sustainability submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding for a playground created at the Florence Fields and Lamprin Park, and whereas the project will create <coughs> playgrounds at both Florence Fields Recreation Area and Lamprin Park, and whereas the project leverages $200,000 in the Massachusetts R Common Backyards Grant, and whereas the applicant shall coordinate with the city school, with the city school department, and Bridge Street School Parents and Advisory Committee to develop the park improvements that complement the existing design for the Bridge Street School playground, um, and report to the CPC prior to construction. And whereas on April 2nd, 2014, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend $50,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, be ordered that $50,000 be appropriated from Community Preservation Act funding to the Northampton Recreation Department and the Northampton Office of Planning and S Sustainability for playground creation, and that the grantee meets the condition approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council. Specifically, 50000 is appropriated from the CPC budget reserves. Um, a motion on this one? Motion to send it forward. Second it. Second Okay. Um, questions for Ms. LaValle on this one? Have we heard about the whether our application for the, our common backgrounds grant has, has that gone through already? Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, let's uh, recognize Mr. Biden. To recognize Second. Mr. Biden. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The grant has been approved. We actually have a signed contract. 
Oh, right. so they're committed. So, right. and for both playgrounds, the whole That's correct. Both That's playgrounds. Great. That's great. That's great. Uh, more questions on this one, <coughs> Valley, or are we good? One more. Oh, yes, please. Um, so there'll be a, a kind of public comment um, opportunity for uh, residents in that area to talk about how they want Lamprin Park to be um, with their ideas for Lamprin Park. There will be. I understand. And so since there's some urgency in, in getting work done on the Bridge Street School Playground as well as Lamprin Park kind of before school starts again, um, do you know when that first forum might be expected to occur roughly? Sorry. I don't know the answer. The city yeah. has engaged Berkshire Design to start doing the work. They're doing the preliminary work they need to have before they can do that form. But I'm not sure the answer to when the form will be. And so it'll be Berkshire Design for both, and so that'll help also with uh, yeah. making sure they sync up. That's Great. correct. Thank you. Well, Mr. Biden, could you throw the light switch again? Yeah. We have some counselors are looking a little shady over here. <laughs> <laughs> Just looking at the monitor in there. <laughs> we can't see them too well. I guess I'll put it for the for the for the um, the Florence Fields, uh, have we figured out um, fund how we're going to fund the future maintenance of them? I know that the mayor asked DPW to give them a projection of what they needed for staffing, but I'm not part of that operational budget. Is if he's here on well, he'll be here on second reading. So again, all in favor of this one, positive representation. Aye. 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 Another a bunch of financial orders tonight. Where is the City of Northampton and the Grantham Group submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding for the Christopher Heights Affordable Assisted Living Project? And where is the project will provide 34 units of affordable? assisted living and a new 83 unit assisted living residence at Village Hill uh, with affordability restrictions to be held by the City of Northampton and the Department of Housing and Community Development and whereas the master plan for redevelopment of the former state hospital includes assisted living and whereas the Grantham group has an excellent record of creating affordable assisted living in Massachusetts and whereas on January 2nd 2013 the Northampton Community Preservation Committee and the City Council awarded 120000 in Community Preservation Act funds to be used to support this project. And whereas on April 2nd, 2014, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that additional $130,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project to be utilized within the same time frame as the first appropriation. And whereas the City's total commitment of local funds is at a very low per unit cost to develop regionally and locally in demand type of affordable housing. Now, therefore, it be ordered that 130000 be appropriated for the Community Preservation Act funding to the City of Northampton for Christopher Heights Assisted Living Affordable Housing Project for the creation of 43 affordable <coughs> assisted living units and that the grantee meet the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee the mayor and the city council specifically 130,000 is appropriated from the CPC affordable housing reserve. Do we have a motion on this one? Move to approve. Second. Second. Okay. Can we recognize um, Wayne Bryan? He's <laughs> Terry's project. This is this is Terry's project. Oh. So we're going to move to recognize Terry. Terry. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And uh, questions for Terry. Council to watch. Terry, um, there's 83 units, 43 units of affordable assistant living. And can you talk about the other 40 units? I, for composition, Walter? Sure, 40 will be uh, private pay market rate. So 40 will be private pay market rate, and the 43 units will fall under a guideline 60% less than the median income. So what happens with the 40 units? Apartments, and something happens financially. What happens with them? That's the great one of the great things about our program is when a resident runs out of money and can no longer afford to pay a market rate rent, they would go on to a low income program and they would still stay in that same apartment. We're able to flop the number of units, the area of the units. So it doesn't have to be if 201 was a market rate unit, that doesn't have to stay market rate forever. That unit can go ahead and be low income tomorrow. 
what is the um, you talk about on this ordinance what is the low per unit cost what does that mean I, I believe the out of the 43 units I think it's roughly five to six thousand dollars per unit that the uh, community preservation committee is putting towards the affordability component of it and I think in the graph they had shown they have spent the community preservation committee has spent much more to bring in one affordable housing unit I don't have the exact figures, uh, but it was over $25,000, I believe, for the average. Thank you. You're welcome. But Terry, as I recall, when we did the 120000 that was being used to leverage some other money from other sources? One more question. Earlier, we were seeking those funds. Yeah, sure. Or, Should I come up? Yeah, okay, sure. Um, and in introduce yourself. Sure. You My name is, thank you, counselors. My name is Walter Rohanian from the Grantham Group. And you're correct, I was here about a year ago. And originally, we had proposed to use the first $120,000 to be put towards the TIF. Uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development did not like that idea. They had wanted to see the money go to bricks and mortar. Um, the application that we had did, did not get funded. So we're in again right now, and we'll find out hopefully in July if the project gets funded. That was my concern about sure. the TIF. Yeah, okay. it, which has been uh, absolved. Councilor uh, Assuming the project is funded, when would you hope to break ground on this? Uh, when would you submit plans? And yeah, we already have uh, planning board approval, okay. um, to, to, which we received in October of 2012. Our goal is to break ground sometime by October. October. Do you have any plans to bring these plans forward just to get any of the community input of residents or other people in the area have you sure. done that yet or yeah, we did we actually had a meeting with the village hill community the mayor had set up a meeting i believe it was at the senior center and we had roughly 30 or 40 people that had attended and gave input towards the project itself great thank you you're welcome so could, could you just piece together for me sure originally I think our total commitment was going to be the 120. Correct. And so what what didn't happen that we're now in for another 130? Okay. So we originally uh, applied in, in October of 2012 with DHCD to go ahead and get the credits, and it was based on a $13.4 million project. Mm -hmm. Over the two years, the project has actually gone to close to $14 million. And so we're looking to help offset some of those costs. And one of the things that we've done is gone back to the Community Preservation Committee to help alleviate some of that cost as well. In addition, our hope is that it shows the Department of Housing and Community Development that there's a large city support here, that they would like to see an affordable assisted living within the community, and their support to the project will hopefully help give them the, the, the presence that they'll say, you know what, the city's behind it, we want to see this project move forward, let's go ahead and have it get funded for the tax credits. Right. And what is the size of the grant you're applying for? It's uh, $5 million of low-income housing tax credits and a $1 million of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. So $6 million would come in from the state. $6 million, the feds. R250, and then how do you finance the rest of it? Yeah, conventional financing through a local bank, actually. Okay. Yeah, we already have a commitment letter from a local bank. For the balance. Correct. Okay. Other questions? Councilor Spector, did you have a question? No, I asked. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Very good. Thank you. Ready to vote in finance? All in favor? Aye. Aye. This is housing supportive services. They're in the wrong order. We can do them out of work, can't we? Which one is this? Housing That's supporting reserve? Yeah, we'll hang on to that one too. Okay. Where is the Northampton Housing Partnership submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding for housing supportive services, a program to hire a resource manager to work with low income housing residents to ensure they're able to maintain its sanity? And where is the project will work to ensure that low and moderate income residents of Northampton are able to sustain and thrive within the Northampton community housing? And whereas the project is supported by numerous community stakeholders, including Northampton Housing Authority, Half Valley CDC, ServiceNet, 
Home City Housing and the Hampshire County Housing Court. And whereas the housing needs assessment commissioned by the Northampton Housing Partnership with funding from the CPA found homeless preservation to be high priority for the city. Uh, further, without supportive services to keep residents in affordable housing, many Northampton families and individuals are in danger of losing their homes and, and consequently becoming homeless. And where is the private or where is the uh, grantee will report to the city on the effectiveness of the program, including eviction prevention, to ensure that the CPA funds are being effectively utilized with a metric that must be approved by the Community Preservation Committee prior to the disbursement of any funds. And whereas the grantee shall present the selected proposal and rationale for the selection of that proposal to the Community Preservation Committee at a regular meeting of the CPC <coughs> prior to the disbursement of funds. And whereas on April 12th, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend $195,000 in Community Preservation Act funds to be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $195,000 be appropriated from the Community Pre Preservation Act funding to the Northampton Housing Partnership for the Housing Supportive Services Project and that the grantee meets the <coughs> conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council, specifically $164,926 is appropriated from the CPC Affordable Housing Reserve and $30,074 is appropriated from the CPA Budgeted Reserve Account. We have a motion on this? Move so, to approve, but I just wanted to let you know, Councillor, you skipped one. I skipped the whereas? Which one did I skip? No. <laughs> you skipped um, Rocky Hill Open oh, Space, okay. number yeah, that, six. just got them out of order. I've got it. We'll go back and do it. Well, I'm just letting you know. Yes, we, we know that. We okay. just got the orders out of order. But this order is in order, and we have a motion on it. Second. I'm giving you Second. an order. Okay, Second. good. So discussion on this one. There we go. <laughs> I um I have several questions on this and I spoke to Mr. Meyer about it but then a bunch more questions popped up um, for one I, the Gazette in April 14th said that the Northampton housing housing partnership is going to select a community agency to run the program right. yes I don't see that in the order um, am I reading it am I missing it that that's reflected in the the committees having to approve the the selected agency okay so it's outside of the order I'm just, I'm just asking. I, I'm, I guess. <laughs> yes, I'm, it was in the application, which okay. is incorporated by reference. Um, another question I have is, um, uh, uh, of the 195,000, Downey Meyer said about 95% will go to salaries. Is that accurate? Yes. So this application completely funds a specified person to work directly with individuals facing eviction. Um, how would a person facing eviction learn about these services? through this this person that will be hired well okay and then how would that person find them this, this person will work with um, property managers and the housing court and the Northampton Housing Authority directly okay um, and now does it matter what the what the what they're facing eviction for I mean they could be it could be it could be non-payment of rent it could be you know maybe a felony conviction if, if they're in public housing does it does it matter what the evictions for it doesn't um, as you know there's many reasons that a person can face eviction and there's different resources that are available depending on the reason and also to, to anyone facing eviction but a lot of times these individuals aren't really aware of the services that are available to them now um, they, they go to, they would go to court for example with them they would yeah. yes they, they could that's a possibility um, but one of the things I, it, people get evicted for and um, the vast majority of the time is our, our um, non-payment of rent so I'm wondering th this person could attend court with them but what could they really do for them in that situation financial counseling could be an option in a case like that okay. so that it could you could teach someone how to do a budget to set aside enough money to pay your rent um, and the other thing is that um, I know some agencies, like ServiceNet, for example, who, who supports this, have outreach workers that do this already. So it, it seems to me like it might be duplicative with, some, some th with things that some agencies already do. We heard from ServiceNet and some other agencies that they're able to do some of this in a limited capacity, but they really need a person dedicated who can do this all the time. They, 
they may be able to offer one service and another agency offers a different service, but it's sort of scattered and someone facing eviction has to jump around and doesn't really have someone dedicated to work with them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor Barsh. Yes, thanks. Um, I talked with Peg Keller about this and um, she said even the Hampshire County Housing Court was in full support of this. And I remember last year bringing in housing partnership of the great concerns of what was happening out there with people losing their homes, okay, their apartments or whatever. I feel this is the right way to go. If you look at hiring somebody, because all these agencies can't get out there, and I think by hiring this one individual for three years, who will be able to work with whoever from housing of getting a list of who is going to need that support from that manager who will also have restrictions of how he has to report or she to the cpa and how that fund funding is being used correct yes that's correct it was very important to the committee to know exactly how many evictions this program will exactly to see if it's going to be a success or is it not working Right, but I know Pat Keller and the Housing Partnership really felt that this needed to be done, and I kind of agree because I think financially people need to have somebody to show them how to handle their money instead of becoming homeless again. So I feel it is worth it. And remind us again what the term is of this program. This will be three years. Three. So this funding is for three years. Three years. Um, so getting to the question of what can actually be done for uh, tenants who have trouble paying their rent, my understanding is part of this might include assigning a representative payee to the tenant. So someone is actually taking over your payments for you if you have difficulties, mm -hmm. physical or mental or circumstantial or whatever, mm -hmm. in doing that. That's, that's part of this. Yes, that right? it could be. Yes, that's correct. It possibly could be. And I imagine also a referral to if, if you do have, uh, if you need mental health treatment, for example, and that's kind of part of your issue in paying your, your rent, then that could be another function that this is providing tenants. Yes. Um, it's a this person would be able to work with individuals and customize each program depending on, on an individual what the person. individual face of eviction requires. Any other questions on this for the Councilor Barge? Um, when Councilor Murphy had talked about how a new program was added on through the CPA, I think this one also is a new one when it comes to housing. Yeah, the changes in the CPA law that were enacted right. recently it's did make this an eligible project. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, more questions? Just quick, yes. do, do you know if any other community has, has done it? Because it is kind of innovative. That's kind of what I, part of what I like about it. It's not a brick and mortar housing project. It's a different approach to keeping people. Not something exactly like this. Yeah, this, no. this will be a first. Well, I think that it's actually good that we're a first in that respect. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm personally glad the CPC committee wants to quantify it and get reports on it and mm -hmm. see if, you know, after three years if it was worth the investment because it is a new thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I like the fact that they're going to hold the, project accountable to report its progress and its successes so and the housing partnership was also completely in favor of that they're hoping that they can show that the program is successful that they'll be able to find funding from other sources as well Adams. could you just explain how they'll be reporting on their own successes because it seems to me like they have a financial interest in stating that they are successful <laughs> the housing partnership isn't actually making any money from doing this yeah. um, so they'll be reporting oh, okay. to the committee about oh, okay so so they're they're right. reviewing them then yes okay thank you any other questions on this one? Nope. All right. All in favor in finance? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Right. Now we're going to go back and deal with the other one. Whereas the Northampton Conservation Commission and the Office of Planning and Sustainability submitted a CPA application for the purchase of a 48-acre parcel to serve as a wildlife connector 
between Arcadia, the Oxbow, and the State Hospital open space areas, and where is this environmentally important location will provide opportunities for trail and habitat connections, and where is the project will allow a multi-use trail connector between Ice Pond and Manhan Rail Trails, and where is the Conservation Commission shall sponsor a zoning change to rezone the parcel as farm, forest, and rivers upon the Commission's taking title, and whereas the threat of residential development exists uh, and would result in wildlife protect lost wildlife protection opportunities, and whereas the project meets the goals of the Sustainable Northampton Plan, Northampton Community Preservation Plan, and Open Space Recreation and Multi-Use Trail Plan uh, to protect open space and provide for passive recreation, and whereas on April 2nd, 2014, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend $200,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used for the project. Um, now, therefore, it be ordered that $200,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Northampton <coughs> Conservation Commission and Office of Planning and S Sustainability for the Rocky Hills Open Space Acquisition Project, and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council. Specifically, $200,000 is appropriated from the CPA budgeted reserve. Motion on this one? Move to approve. Second. Second. All right. You want to tell us about this one? Sure. Uh, so this was a <coughs> priority in the open space plan for protection, both for the wildlife values that it has. It's a connector between Arcadia and the Western Hills, and also for a trail connection between the Ice Pond Trail Spur, which currently doesn't go anywhere, and the Manhan Rail Trail. And this is really the only viable area where the city could hope to put a, a trail connection. Now, do you have a map or something so we can see where this property is? Uh, there was a map in the application. I don't have one. We don't have a map here. No. Can you tell us where it is? Uh, this is, um, if you're driving towards East Hampton and you go under the bike path bridge, it's on the right. It, ha it had a for sale sign in front of it for quite some time. And is it residentially zoned? It is, it is owned business park. It is owned business park, because I know that this says it would prevent residential development, but I didn't think there was something residentially zoned over there. It, no, it's its own business park. Its own business park. It's behind the, the owners. Yeah. The property is owned by Carol Hughes, who lives in uh, Pensacola, Florida. And my question is, reading this, Wayne, apparently there could be a threat to develop that 48 acres so so it's on the market what, one thing to be clear is we do not usually come before you when we've assigned option we don't have a signed option for this so this deal may not go anywhere but having being ready to go forward seems like the best way to help our negotiations but the properties on the market she believes is worth more than we're offering um, but so it's on the market for for housing development um, and um, the, the problem is you know, Mass Audubon's been looking for years with the city as a way to connect mm -hmm. Mass Audubon and the State Hospital and, and the western part of the city, and we've been looking for all for the bike path connection. So the owner does know that the city is interested in it, correct? Right. And have you already said to her 200000 So this is just CPA. The, the, it would be a, a larger number than this. Oh, okay. Um, <coughs> I thought so that was low. We can't legally pay more than appraised value. So we offered her to pay exactly what appraised value is. She thought the appraisal was low, and we couldn't offer more even if we wanted to. Um, we believe, because we're willing to offer appraised value, that she's very likely to do a market test and then come back to us. But if she doesn't, we wouldn't go ahead and take this grant. At, 40, at 43 acres or 48 acres, and it is zoned where apparently homes could be built on it how many homes do you think or give me an estimate that could be built on that property uh probably six possibly seven but the the problem is it would need require a lot of infrastructure to do that and that's what brings the value down is that okay. you know you look at six or seven lots and it sounds like a lot but you spend you know half a million dollars in infrastructure and not so much anymore i know the area and i agree about the connection with it, and I think it is a right move. So I just wanted to let you know. 
Um, you mentioned Mass Audubon. Are they uh, partners in this financially, or I mean, have they been they're not equal partners, but certainly they're partners in this. Um, one of the things that whenever we buy land with CPA, we're required to put a conservation restriction on it. Most nonprofits want an endowment for that conservation restriction to cover their cost. Mass Audubon's happy to take a CR, and they'd be responsible for fundraising their own piece of that. Um, they may be willing to help with fundraising as well to help us get beyond the CPAB. So it's only being partners until we get something signed. I don't know exactly what that means in terms of dollar amount. Didn't they help us out once before? Yes, they've been wonderful partners before a couple other times, yes. Just a couple of things. In the fourth whereas, I don't think we can mandate the uh, Conserva Conservation Commission to sponsor a zoning change, and that's because they're part of the they're an agency of the executive branch. I, I don't think we could do that, so I'd request maybe if we could change that language by second reading. But my other point is that um, I support this, and I supported all open space um, purchases of land. But when we're talking about the threat of residential development, um, I think we I think we need to consider that we're running out of developable pro properties in the city and simultaneously trying to expand our tax base. So, um, you know, I, I, in the back of my mind, and I think other people's minds, we wonder just, and, and I've, I, I always ask this question to you, Wayne, just how much are we trying to preserve in this city? Because, you know, it's, in, it's important to preserve land, for the environment, for other reasons, but it's also important to, um, to develop and, and increase the tax base so there are more contributors to the tax base. And so when we talk about the threat of residential development, um, I don't want to always consider it a threat. I, I want us to consider that we do have to expand our tax base. Right. I, I agree with you. I, I think, and I wasn't involved with writing this, but I think what the CPA committee was, was thinking in that language is the threat being site-specific. On this particular site, it's not an appropriate place for housing. You're absolutely right. We need spots. You know, certainly these 73 housing units that were just announced at the state hospital is wonderful. I mean, we, we absolutely need those kinds of units. I don't disagree with, with the premise, and the language probably should have said the threat in the middle of a sensitive wildlife corridor or something like that. Thank you. Oh, just um, I'm glad that you mentioned the site specific. This location, the, in fact, the, uh, the value of this particular tract along Route 10 towards East Hampton um, for the wildlife as a corridor for folks from for the animals from uh, Arcadia and that area up to the state hospital was brought up when we first were talking about the industrial park on Route 10. It was yes. A really large concern then. So I'm glad that there's uh, some movement on this <coughs> possible movement, and I'm, I hope that it'll work out with the property owner. It actually reminded me of something, if I, if I could, it's about that controversy. So one of my first tasks when I was hired 25 years ago was to try to find some compromise about what became the business park. Because there were some people who wanted to preserve it all because the wildlife corridor had someone to develop it all. And the business park zoning that eventually passed said this land could be developed, but not within 200 feet of a stream, and only 50% of the land could be developed. And because all the resources went to the state hospital, this land sat there for 25 years, not developed. So this is actually half an equation that you guys just voted on about six months ago. So if you remember, there's a parcel of land owned by um, the Raymond family, mm -hmm. which was also zoned business park, which only would have allowed 50% of the site to be developed. And you would, our request, rezone that property general industrial to say this land is the right part of the business park where we can get intense development, let's use every inch of that property. This parcel we're talking about tonight is the opposite of the business park, the land that shouldn't be preserved. So going back to, to your comment about what's the right place for development for both commercial and residential, the southerly part of the business park I hope gets much more densely developed than originally envisioned, the northerly part I hope doesn't get there. Though this, it is now zoned business park. That's correct. Business park does not permit residential development. No, business park does. It does? So business park, the site business park used to be suburban residential. When it was zoned business park, it kept all the uses that suburban residential allow by right, and then it allowed business park on top of it. That's what makes it different from our industrial districts. But it also has commercial potential. That's correct. Right. And, that, and that's one thing that really does concern me because, and I have usually no objection to buying open space in places that aren't available, but this is on Route 10, which has commercial capacity. And 
we still have residential land we can develop, but we have a very limited amount of commercial land we can develop. You're absolutely right. This parcel doesn't have real commercial ca capacity. The reason it was added to the business park was the original vision for the business park was some open space, some housing, some businesses. This site, the only frontage it has in Route 10 is between the bike path and the road in a deep pit that's pure wetlands. That's why well, I was kind of looking for a map because right. that where is it in that strip? Right. We, we can send it to you, but yeah, this site, uh, the, the, both the frontage on Route 66 is all wetlands except for the gravel road that goes to the gas pumping station, and the frontage on Route 10 is all wetlands with a steep slope. So the, the area you could do six homes. So is, is it between, the, there's a, a red dwelling there and the bike path? Is, it's that, is it located in between? The parcel in between is actually owned by Rainer Door, where they plan to move their business, and it's actually behind Rainer Door. So it, it, has, it is a three-acre parcel on Route 10 that's all wetlands. Then it's broken up by the bike path. The, the parcels don't connect, and then it goes up a steep hill. So that's why the Route 10 access is sort of illusory. Well, I'll, what I'll do is, in between readings, I'll catch up with the, with the map and see exactly where it is. Right. And, and it's, frankly, it's listed, so you can look up the, the listing for it. <laughs> Very good. Any other questions in finance? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Return that one. And this is the fairgrounds, whereas the Hampshire Franklin Hamden Agricultural Society, which is the three county fair, submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding for preservation study of the three county fair grandstand. And whereas the project, the, the project study would determine costs and methodology to preserve and modernize uh, the historic listing of the grandstand and whereas CPA funds would be used only on development of plans for historic preservation of the structure and not for adaption purposes and whereas the Northampton Fairgrounds is the longest continuously running fair in the country and the fairgrounds has embarked on a long-range development of its grounds the master plan identifies refurbishment of the grandstand as an important component of the redevelopment uh, and whereas on April 2nd 2014 the community preservation Committee voted four to two to recommend that $26,500 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $26,500 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Hampshire Franklin Hamden Agricultural Society for the grandstand study and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council. Specifically, the $26,500 is appropriated from the CPA budgeted reserve. A motion? Motion to approve. Second. Second. All right. Uh, questions for Sarah? Mr. Yes, Sarah. Um, I know I had called um, Wayne's office on Wednesday. I have great concerns, and I'd like to know that it was voted on a four to two. What were the reasons why the other two did not support this? So the entire committee likes the project as a whole. They think that the grandstand is a really unique and special structure and would like to see it preserved. Um, the two no votes were due to um, discussions about fun funding the feasibility study rather than the actual historic repairs to the building and also some concerns about what the results of the study could be. I mean, it, it could be possible that the study comes back and says that there's really no way to adapt the grandstand and preserve its historic features. So it was, it was just those unknowns that made those two people vote against it. Well, then, if that's the case, wouldn't this be premature? Uh, it isn't. The committee has funded feasibility studies in the past for historic projects. One of them was the the Leeds pedestrian bridge and it's <laughs> sort of you're, you're taking a gamble you you might get a, a huge return on investment or you might not but there it's really hard to find these up front but what I'm saying is if it turns out was there concern that the feasibility study might show this is not worth saving uh, because, because what I'm saying if that's no just because it is such an important building to the fairgrounds and they are committed to saving it but there just were okay. there are a lot of unknowns um, there, are there any other ways of, of, of attain historic listing? I mean, is there only one way? 
on the on the National Register? Or? <laughs> yeah, I mean, is there a way? I mean, is 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 there a way of avoiding this expense? Is is that not possible? You could obtain listing on the National Register and not do the feasibility study, but then the fairgrounds would be in the same place that they are now. That they have this building that is really tough to use and doesn't really meet their needs. Is that a question, look, Council Member? That's a questionable one. I, I cannot believe that there wouldn't be any records of this being of historical preservation. Oh, it's clearly I mean, a historical why, why a study at 26,500? So the study will enable the fairgrounds to figure out how they can retrofit this, this historic structure and make it more usable and what they need to do to, to repair it and m make sure that it's safe and usable in the long term. Can I request the, the minutes of that meeting for next reading, please? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Council. I, mean, I, I think one of the results of the fairgrounds being the longest uh, continuously running fair in the country is that it's, it's old. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so I know the fairgrounds has also been looking at, there's the, right on Bridge Street, we're not far from it. There's an old structure that they've been wanting to tear down for a while, too. Even that's been a, a challenge. You wouldn't think it is to, t to tear down a structure, but yet that is part of their process of, of renovating the fairgrounds and trying to turn it into um, an economic, more of an economic asset for the city of Northampton. So I think from time to time you, you have to do these studies to determine whether um, or how you go about preserving some of these very old structures. Um, if the figure had to turn this into a question, <laughs> um, maybe I just won't do it. What do you think about that? <laughs> I like that one, Ryan. <laughs> it's like Jeopardy here. <coughs> so it's not going to turn into a question. Oh, you did. Well, she thought what about it. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Adams. So is it likely that if this passes, there'll be further requests? There may be, um, depending on the results of the, the study and the expense involved and possible grants and timing, then the fairgrounds could potentially come back with another request. Is that another question, Luke, or are you all set? Go ahead. No. Do you have a question? I'm fine. You're fine? All right. And any other questions? And in finance, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I said aye. I said aye. All right. I'm going to abstain <laughs> from this one. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm abstaining from that. I think this is the last one. <coughs> yeah, once we can get one more oh, order, then we can do the business. One more. Whereas the Northampton Conservation Commission submitted an application for a survey of the Sawmill Hills, and whereas the project will survey, blaze, and monitor existing boundaries and will allow the Commission to prepare for future acquisitions of surrounding property, and whereas similar surveys in the Mineral Hills, Broad Brook, and Fitzgerald Lake areas have proven extremely useful for the Commission for stewardship and planning activities, and whereas on April 2, 2014, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that 40000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $40,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Conservation Commission for Saw Mill Hills Survey and the grantee meet the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council. Specifically, the 40000 is appropriated from the CPA budgeted reserve. Move to approve. Second. Second. Sarah, um, this forty thousand dollars <laughs> is being used strictly for Sawmill Hills, correct? That's correct. And how many acres? How many acres of property are you surveying? About six hundred. That's what you're trying to find out. Yes, that's true. <laughs> the Sawmill Hills is one area where we don't really have a good handle on property on boundaries. The, and is this the area, Wayne, because you and I have been working with some of my residents on Sylvester Road about having problems with boundary lines where some of my residents felt that because it was their private property 
that there was a problem with the city not having the boundary lines and people coming on their property? So, okay. That's correct. Yeah. Some of the parcels in the Selma Hills have been surveyed uh, and the boundaries marked, and many have not been. Um, the land, you know, it, it's sort of the oddest area in my experience in town. Many areas like Fitzgerald Lake, some would own a large parcel of land. The Soma Hills, if you look at the deeds going back 100 years ago, you'd own a house in Florence Center and a woodlot in the Soma Hills. So the boundaries were much less defined than they were elsewhere. Exactly. All these long linear parcels. So, yes. So we are looking at 600 acres more to do? That's the top of my head. I, I don't remember the exact number. It's the right ballpark, but I'm not exactly okay. sure. Okay. Thank you. And we're going to survey land that we currently own and then land that we don't own, but we may be interested in acquiring at some point. That's correct. And, correct. and, and most importantly, sort of control to tie everything together. So even where we have multiple surveys for individual parcels, the two surveys don't always agree with each other. So creating a good control helps us both now and in the future. And what's the mix, roughly? I mean, how much do we own? How much is land we don't own? That we're most of it's land that we own, and then the parcels we don't own are the ones that we are budding. Sorry, that's fine. Was that the yeah. Do you have a question? No. Here she does. I just wanted to ask actually about the blazing specifically because mm. I know that um, up in Roberts Hill on Ward 7, we actually had uh, David Litterer come and do blazing um, as a volunteer. And he's done a number of blazing in all kinds of conservation areas all over you know, the cities of Western Massachusetts. Um, and that might be one way to look at some savings in terms of um, that piece of this project. So um, I, I don't know him, but where we would tend to want to do is have a surveyor blaze the boundaries the first time, make sure there's good pins, make sure we know control. And once they're in, we're happy to have volunteers go through and refresh those blazes every two years. But we're not comfortable, frankly, having a forester or someone with less accuracy do the first so you're talking about blazing boundaries, Bound, not, not the trails. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, trails are much more flexible, okay. assuming they're on our property, but it's the boundary lines. Really. Um, and we're, we're also doing a project where we're beginning to put um, signs up on our boundaries facing both ways, entering the property saying you're entering conservation land, here's the rules, and leaving the property saying you're entering private property, don't trespass. So that process is included in the cost here? No, when, once we have a surveyor blaze the boundaries, then then we can find the boundaries easily and we go up and with volunteers mm -hmm. and put them, we, we already have metal signs, that's easy. We just want to put them on our property, not off our property. And, and Council, are you? Council? Yes, um, I want to thank you, Wayne, for helping us out on Sylvester Road and working with our residents so that we could solve this problem. And I think it's a very good idea on how you're handling this. Thank, Thank you. you. And Councilor Barge, this is the area where your residents have had issues, so this will help that problem today? And also Alyssa's too. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on this one? So in finance, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. You're aware of public <laughs> Did you, uh, did so you now, for any question, no, no, like what she's asking is, we, you know, we've done this in finance. <coughs> when it comes up to vote in reg in full council, you don't have any more questions for Sarah. No. Then she can. No. Nope. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> um, you other, no, there are other issues that we need to have Mr. Fiden here for as well on the. He's got something later. Okay. Yeah. So we won't send him home. <laughs> so now, um, Councilor Adams has a request for some new business in finance. So we'll see what Mr. Count, Mr. Adams has new business. Um, I've, we all noticed that it's, it seems, I think, um, redundant and inefficient to have a finance committee meeting and talk about those exact Could you speak things. louder, please? Sure. It seems redundant to have a finance committee meeting Can, which really consists of four members of the council, even though it probably looks like the entire council because the, the whole council is free to contribute, and then have the full council discuss those same exact things right after in the regular regular meeting. So what I'm hoping to do is, um, if there is interest, try to make it more efficient and do away with that. Councilor Spector. Yeah, I would agree with that. As long as there was the option, <clears throat> because the Finance Committee on occasion does need to meet outside of the of, of this meeting so as long as there remained that option 
that if the Finance Committee needed to meet and call a meeting outside. But I, I agree. I think it's kind of we all kind of take part. We hear the discussion. I think our last meeting was really clear. We had one item on the Finance Committee, and we said, let's just refer this to the whole. Let, let's not even have the Finance. And it works just as well. So I, I really don't see the benefit of having Finance Committee and then bringing it all back again. And uh, Councilor Barge. Councilor Adams, I thought you had concerns of us not having 10 meetings in our regular finance committee. And I thought hearing from you that we would continue on with a finance committee, our regular finance committee, versus having it here. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying we should necessarily do away with finance committee meetings outside of, of this council um, if they're necessary. but. What I don't see as necessary is discussing these matters in finance and then discussing them in the full, with the full council right after. Um, I spoke with Councillor Murphy earlier today, um, and we were talking about the, how we have not had any meetings outside of the full council. Uh, with, we've had finance committee meetings within the full council meetings, but have not had that third meeting. Ten of them. Ten going on 11, a month, 11 months um, in a row. And the reason why is because... Um, well, I guess Councilor Murphy can answer that, but we don't. Once once we discuss them here, um, they haven't needed they haven't needed the third meeting. Mm -hmm. So, and and I can explain some of the rationale because I did speak with the council president on this topic at the beginning of the session, having continuing with this. He called it, I think, a kabuki theater, <laughs> of having <laughs> initially of having finance here uh, and, and not doing finance separately and then bringing things here. And, and I actually was an advocate for a couple of reasons, and I talked to Councillor Adams about this today. Um, first of all, we don't duplicate the discussion. We have the discussion in finance, and then we simply vote in council. Um, we could certainly have a finance committee, or committee earlier in the day, but that would be a burden to the staff because they'd come to finance, and then they come here again to make the case to all of you. We thought in the end it was a best practice that we all do it together. First of all, it kind of almost extends the size of finance to the whole council because while there's only four of us voting, you all get to participate in the discussion and it's only one discussion one time essentially because when we bring it up in full council, all we do is vote on it because we've already just had the discussion and it, it, it doesn't require the other councilors to come to a different finance committee and it allows us to have finance here together and it also puts finance on television. If we move it away from this period of time than it isn't on television. And I think municipal finance is important not just to the Finance Committee, but to all the councilors equally and to all of the constituents equally. I think you'll agree in the time you've been here, people are always asking about where the money's going. So <coughs> it was more inclusive, it got it on television. And to the third meeting, yeah, because we do try, in fact, in the past we've had the audit presentation often in finance, and with Susan Wright we agreed let's do it in the full council because it's everybody's business. So we actually made a conscious decision to keep it the way it is because it really doesn't extend the meeting because when it's time for council to vote, we just vote. But we don't have to discuss it again. And it includes everyone and it gets it on television. Um, the other thing that, that kind of makes a difference is um, that we don't have the third meeting. We only do that when there's something specifically to deal with that we haven't dealt with in council because we already meet twice a month in council. We do the third one if there's something specific to do at it, like when we sold the Kennedy or the, um, the Florence Grammar School, a lot of that happened in finance as committee work outside of this body. The report came back here. So we had something to deal with that we did off television in finance committee because it really was just committee work for most of the time. But that's why it is the way it is. And, and I did review it with the council president prior to our starting this council session to say, should we keep it here or shouldn't we keep it here? And that's why we kept it here. So just some history on it. Councilor, um, Well, we're not gonna, I'm, I'm assuming we're not gonna make, do anything about this tonight. No, no. So I would just, um, uh, I, I would expect that this is something that will, if there is a change offered by Councillor Adams, that that would be something that will get referred to <laughs> ordinance and then and then back. But I do uh, favor the idea of having some way of, 
Well, some way of not having the repeat vote one after the other, whether it's somehow incorporating all the business into one package or yeah. whatever, but it, yeah. it does seem the, silly the, to. The one other thing um, that it does facilitate the way it is, because things go to finance before they come to council, um, it, it does afford the mayor and the finance director the ability to wait to write up to before the meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, they can wait until they have to print the agenda to decide what's coming here. So that flexibility allows them to actually add more things in, because a lot occurs between our two meetings. So if it, in fact, is at the same meeting, that gives them the maximum amount of time to add things to the agenda that might be financially necessary to deal with. So that's why, if it wasn't in the meeting, it should be just before the meeting or the same day to facilitate them the same deadline for, for publishing their agenda and meeting notice. Um, I guess what I'm saying is we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves yeah. in terms of the, the details on this because okay. it would have to be mm. discussed. Just I'll just say that what I'm hearing, what I'm taking away is that we'd like the option of not to have the redundancy but not to right. dispense with the committee entirely. Give maybe the mayor the option of right. presenting it just directly to the full council without finance committee. So I'll right. see if I can look into right. that. Yeah, and we talked about that. Is Does the protocol say it has to go to finance or could the mayor just bring it to full council? Right. In which case, you don't need the two votes on this. Right, thing. right. That would be interesting. Maybe we could incorporate all committee meetings into this meeting. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I agree. Because it seems like we just are cutting off all these committees, so put them all together. All right. Well, yeah. um, what's, uh, motion to adjourn. Absolutely. Second. All in favor of adjourning finally? Aye. 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 Uh, we're back in the regular meeting. I'll appoint Councillor Klein and Councillor Barge to enrollment. Um, we'll move to the financial order, reprogramming $13,677.51 from Jackson Street School Tile to Library Air Conditioning. Second. Is there any further, is there any further discussion on this? Roll call vote, please. Mm -hmm. Thanks for yes. Council yes. Council Klein. Yes. Council Yes. Council Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sierra. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. And move suspension of rules for um, the second read. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Move Rolls. second reading. Second. Further discussion? Roll call. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shea. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Passes. Uh, financial no order number two: appropriation of one hundred sixty-five thousand dollars from Community Preservation Act funding to playground rehabilitation, Bridge Street School. This is on first. Is there a motion on first? Move to approve. Second. Yeah. Further discussion on this matter? Roll call. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Sierra. Yes. Councillor Spector. Yes. Councillor Adams. Yes. Financial order number three. Appropriation of $50,000 from Community Preservation Act funding to Playground Creation, Northampton Recreation Department, and Office of Planning and Development. Move to approve. Second. Second. Is there any further discussion? Roll call. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sierra. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Financial order number four. Appropriation of $130,000 from Community Preservation Act funding to Christopher Heights Assisted Living, Grantham Group, Eight. and Northampton Mayor's Office. Is there a motion on first reading? Move to approve. Second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sierra. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Financial order number five. Appropriation of $200,000 from Community Preservation Act funding to Rocky Hill Open Space Acquisition, Northampton Conservation Commission, and Office of Planning and Development. Move to approve. Second. Further discussion? Nope. Roll call, please. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
Councilor Lubart. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sierra. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Financial order number six, appropriation of $195,000 from Community Preservation Act funding to Housing Supportive Services, Northampton Housing Partnership. Move to approve. Second. Further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sierra. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Financial order number seven, appropriation of $26,500 from Community Preservation Act funding to Grandstand Preservation Three County Fairgrounds. Is there a motion on first reading? Move to approve. Second. Is there further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Murphy. Abstain. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sierra. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Financial order number eight, appropriation of $40,000 from Community Preservation Act funding to Sawmill Hill Survey, Northampton Conservation Commission. Move to approve. Further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. We'll move to orders and ordinances. Order number one, change to. Yeah, we did the survey. Uh, Sorry, I moved to approve. Right. Okay, so we're on order number one, change to city council rules. Rule three, suspension of council rules on first reading. Um, I'll give a brief explanation of this. I was um, snooping around the charter one night when I was learned that um, a practice of ours, we sometimes um, suspend the rule of referral of certain committee, of certain members who are up for appointments or reappointments. And I noticed from reading the charter that we can't do this, or so I thought. So I um, asked the solicitor to opine on it, and in his memorandum, he confirmed that that's correct. <coughs> we can no longer do that. Um, could, because that section of the charter states that any department head who is up for appointment or reappointment, or any member of a multiple member body up for appointment or reappointment has to go to that committee. So. It, that's all. It, spe it doesn't specify anything further. You know, th there's no mandate, for example, that um, an applicant have to, has to come to the committee. For example, that's not mandated. Nothing's right. mandated. The committee needs discussion. to discuss it. Just the committee has to take it up. I can read the memorandum. If, if we we all read it. We are yeah. have it. Okay. My question about that, um, just because we did this at the last meeting, where we, um, it's very rare that it's a new referral that we don't refer, um, but we did. Uh, appoint someone to the Council on Aging based on the testimony of a couple of counselors. Right. And so do we have to do, I mean, since that was a new, that was a new appointment um, in terms of, but this memo actually states that even reappointments need mm -hmm. to go yep. through that process. So things are, so yep. basically things will be held up. All, re, you know, things will be, well, it says seven to 45 days. So the, there is a possibility of a little, the, the attorneys, um, memo says that we're our our rule says that they have to come back within seven to 45 days but that still could leave some little limbo period of somebody being unappointed during that little time or would have i'm to also follow. right i'm also Anything. checking out the old charter to see if there's any language in that old charter in regards to suspension 
And if it and if it does say that we were not supposed to suspend, then we've been in violation. I'm just letting you know. No, I mean, I would concur because we, we can suspend a council rule by our own decision. Right, but we can't right. suspend the charter, which is what Councilor Adams pointed out. But I, th I think we may want to, if this is the case, audit the occasions, at least since the beginning of this session, where we did the expeditious appointment of people that we now have got to cycle through. But there were regular reappointments, so there's many of those. There's many, yeah. Cause it doesn't mean we have, we just, as the appointments committee, just to need to just bring it back, yeah. look at it and bring, we don't even have to meet with the people. So we may want to audit that. What about Council the department Mark. heads? Same thing. But who would be the department heads? I've never seen us do a department head. Any department head that comes before this council under this charter. Well, who who have you seen come in? There haven't, I mean, I haven't no? seen any. Yeah. But, I think but, we should have a list of but when. But just those things, those names could just go to the committee. It doesn't mean that the, the committee can use its own judgment in terms of whether to meet with those people or to just yeah. look, review the yeah. application. Council Murphy. But you still can get a list from the mayor's office. Because we'll call, or look at our when, we, when we did get the evaluation of, of all the appointments, most of them we agreed would be appointed by the mayor with consent of the council. So for instance, we just did interviews for a replacement for Joe Cross as an assessor. The mayor will appoint that position and send it to us and we would have to re refer it. And the, Councilor Carney, Councilor like you suggested about the applications. He has the floor. No, I'm done. Oh. Okay, Councilor O'Donnell. I'm happy to appeal to Councilor LaBarge. Thank you. On the applications, even with appointments and evaluations, we've always told the counselors because there were some issues. There are telephone numbers there, and it gives the rights of every counselor to call who that applicant is at home and talk with them. Councilor my, my question is, did the um, solicitor give his opinion about whether, in fact, we would have to go back and redo the ones? Uh, um, he hasn't. He's not. Okay. Um, so, I mean, that question could be put to him. If um, Councilor Spector, if that question is put to him, then the question also should be put to him. A second question would be, how far back do we go? Because we've been doing this for years and years. Exactly. So, if that's the case too, we have to ask him if votes that they took could be subject to challenge and or jeopardy. Yeah. So I would suggest sometimes, as a a tax attorney, I heard tell somebody, I think it's sometimes it's better not to ask certain questions. And I would suggest <laughs> we leave well enough alone and we move forward on this because sometimes, as you know, it's better not to ask a lawyer I a certain agree. question. And I would just move forward on the, and, and go, moving forward, we do this in the way that the solicitor has recommended we do. Is there any other question? Counselor, I agree. Maybe getting that information would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And, and, and certainly I can't see us going back further than the beginning of this session, let's say. Well, that, if we start to ask the legal question, it's not then our purview to decide what makes common sense or right. what we feel like we should do. I would suggest we move forward from here on end and do it according to how the solicitor is suggesting. Again, just because the solicitor pointed out that seven, that these um, must be returned, the opinion of the committee must be returned within seven to 45 days that we just encourage the mayor's office to make sure that any appointments that are coming to us come well in advance so that there isn't a, a matter. Because I don't even think that right now we return those within yeah. 7 to 45 That's days and yeah. regularly. And, and sometimes we don't see them. And exactly. We don't see them, the actual applications, until our minutes get posted, you know, until our notice and minutes get posted. And there's been a long, the mayor knows they're coming. Right, so we may want to see if we can set up a protocol. We get them a little early. Right, that's right. Councilor Barge? Yes, Councilor Adams, maybe we could take appointments and evaluations and put them here at City Council and let us interview them. Like finance. We certainly sure. can do there that. Um, An <laughs> so I'll, I'll, um, I'll read the order. Um, in City Council, April 17th, 2014, upon the recommendation of Councilor Jesse M. Adams, ordered that the following changes to the city council rules are adopted. Three, suspension of council rules. Suspension of these rules or any part thereof shall require a two-thirds majority of the quorum present. Nothing herein shall be construed to authorize suspension of any provision of the charter of the city of Northampton or any ordinance of the city of Northampton or of any federal or state statute rule or regulation. Move to refer to committee. Second. Um, this, just point of clarification. This was put on 
for first reading, but I think we should refer it. So, yeah. we'll, so we'll we should. Get that. So it was, it was made and seconded, correct? Yes. Is there any further discussion on this rule proposal? All those in favor of referring it to ordinance? Aye. 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 Do you need a roll call on? No, because it's no, referral. It's Order number two, City Council adopts the Capital Improvement Program FY 2015 through FY 2019. This is on second reading. Is there a motion on second reading? Second. Is there any further discussion on this? All those in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? Abstentions? <coughs> Order number three, support for private shared vehicle services. This is on first reading. So moved. Is there a second? No, oh. second. I'll read, I'll read it. In City Council, April 17, 2014, upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz and the Transportation and Parking Commission, whereas the Sustainable Northampton Comprehensive Plan recommends support for private shared vehicle services because each well-run car share vehicle can replace 15 or more cars, reducing congestion and demand valuable parking spaces and make urban living with its smaller ecological footprint more viable and whereas Zipcar is interested in expanding their six car share six car car share presence at Smith College with a two car presence downtown and other services could follow ordered that city council declares a surplus to city needs up to six parking spaces in the John Gare the third parking garage and or in city service parking spaces to be made available for car sharing services and further the mayor is authorized to re sign renewable leases in compliance with MGL chapter 30 B to allow car sharing services to use these spaces and associated space for information signage in return for making the services available to Northampton residents as and visitors at no cost to the city and other terms and conditions as the mayor finds reasonable so it's motion to made and seconded um, discussion on this matter Councillor Klein um, I first want to state that I do think that Zipcar is a really good alternative for individuals who don't own a car. I just am not sure that um, we necessarily need to subsidize a for-profit uh, company by offering the parking spaces. Um, and I did a little bit of research on Zipcar. It was um, founded in Cambridge in 2000 as a small entrepreneurial venture, but it was acquired by Avis in 2013 for $500 million. <laughs> Um, and just some uh, revenue statistics here, or revenue numbers. Uh, in the fourth quarter of 2013, when it was acquired, the Avis uh, earned $74 million from it, $246 million for the full year. Um, so essentially, and I talked to David Pomerantz, Northampton's Director of General Services, who uh, told me that the revenue from a space in the John Gare garage is $4,400 thousand dollars per year so if we're offering two spaces we're looking at losing almost nine thousand um, dollars by offering free spaces to a corporation to park their cars so I, I just think that um, you know giving an incentive to zip car doesn't it doesn't affect incentivizing uh, the residents of Northampton to use zip cars so I, I just have some question about that piece of this uh, ordinance. Councillor Mark, yes, Councillor O'Donnell. Councillor, I think you were. She declined. Oh, okay. Um, I uh, th this I was in two committees where this was debated and this this was brought up: uh, Transportation, the Parking Commission, uh, and and Ed Lou, as you know. And um, I, I agree, it's a serious a serious concern. And when we get to the ordinance part of this, we can discuss some of the changes that were made. Um, I observe that the way this order is written, um, it seems to me it no longer requires that the mayor give the spaces away for free. I, correct me if I'm wrong about that, but I think it just says that the mayor may lease them according to the terms that he finds reasonable. Councillor Spector. Yeah, I was just going to follow up that in Ed Lou, we had this discussion, and perhaps we can recognize. Uh, He's already recognized it. Wayne no. Feigen could come up because that was my understanding too. Is that what we're <coughs> doing? Is the mayor will do the actual contract, and um, 
but if you could clarify that for us. Sure, that's absolutely true. That the, the mayor will be negotiating a lease, um, and I'm assuming it's for some consideration. I think that the basic point is probably true. It's probably for less consideration than individual cars would come. So, so background, we tried to get ZIP 10 years ago, or eight years ago, and at the time they would only come if we guaranteed them $10,000 a year business, which we obviously weren't in a position to do, and they didn't come. We then worked with Smith, and they came to Smith College. Smith does not charge for the parking spaces. Um, the model for many years was ZIP and their competitors, there are a few competitors out there, would work for large cities at their own risk and for small cities and universities only if their business was guaranteed. Mm -hmm. They've changed the model. Now they're reaching out to more, I don't want to say that we're a marginal market, but we're not as big a market as a big city. Um, but, so, but the issue is their, clear, their margin is much, much tighter in our market than it is in Boston or New York or Cambridge or bigger markets. So the numbers just don't work yet. You know, over time, we expect that they're continue to, to go up. Massperg just released a report saying that total uh, vehicle miles traveled has dropped, I think, 6 percent. Um, and that, we, you know, this seems to be a long-term trend. Many people are using shared car services, mass transit. And if that holds, the numbers are going to work more for these kinds of things. We're not quite there yet. Um, I, quite frankly, all cards to the table, the mayor will be negotiating this, but I believe they're probably going to pay, some, willing to pay somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 or $60 a month per parking space. So certainly less than, you know, the $90 a month that we get for a parking pass. But remember, a parking pass, when you get it, is good for one family and one car. Zipcar serves 15 families or 20 families. So if you look at sort of the total cost, the, the public subsidy, if you will, per Zipcar customer is far less than the public subsidy per, you know, other customers. So I just want to follow up on that. So essentially what we're trying to do is give the mayor some nego I think most people want to have Zipcar here. I think most of us would rather that Zipcar paid not only for the space, but paid us more money, gave us some percentage. But the problem, what you're saying is, the problem is we're still not quite at that place where they might not come. We had this experience a few years ago. We would like them to come. And so this is about saying, let the mayor negotiate a deal with them. A piece of that deal might be, in, at least, and this is just the first, it could just be a one-year thing, might be, all right, in order to get you to come here and try this because you don't want to come, will give you parking spaces at a reduced fee or even free. The second year, they, he could turn around and say, hey, it worked really well, you made a profit here, we're not gonna do that again. So I think it's just, I think the desire to have them here is, is the main thing, and then we're saying, negotiate the best you can for the city. Right, right, it, it's absolutely right. I mean, remember, there are multiple companies, so it, this won't be like a secret negotiation. You will know when the market is ripe because instead of only one company wanting to come here, we have three right. companies. And when three companies want to go here, then the markets change. So we're not there yet. I, whether it's one year or 10 years, I think we're still going to see In that. other words, after year one, if it were to happen that Zipcar comes in at the name of, and they come in, they do really well, well, then year two, we have better negotiating because we've got two other companies we could then go to. That's correct. that gave the mayor the authority, so. Right. Yeah, we, th those are adopted in the final version. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so we're talking about adding two cars, um, but we're talking about six spaces. Is that just for ease of parking? If, they're, if we're just having them bring in two cars initially, why do we need six spaces? This is partially about leaving our options open for both them to grow okay. and competitors to come. So, so Zipcar has told us they're only interested in two. So Zipcar started Smith College, whatever, six or seven years ago with two cars, and Smith guaranteed it. It's now grown, Smith doesn't guarantee it, and there's now six cars on campus. So we'd like the flexibility to grow the program, whether it's with Zip or Enterprise or Hertz's equivalent um, over time. So yes, because it's in essence to avoid the monopoly. We don't want them to say, oh, you only can do two, you gave it to us. We'd like to be able to brace them growing with somebody else. So would they be giving us whatever the agreed lease amount on six spaces or just yeah, on those just two? two? And they'd only have two spaces. Okay. So okay. You'd, be, you'd be giving or the mayor authority for six. Mm -hmm. On day one, it would be two, but okay. you know, if it grows. They, they tend to always do these cars in pairs because you do one car, the car's not there, you might be frustrated. So they tend to grow in pairs. So 
two, four, six. Yeah. Councilor Klein. I want to actually address this kind of monopoly question because um, with in the research that I did, as of July 2012, there were 26 car sharing programs in the United States. And so, um, you know, we're, we're focused here on Zipcar, and I'm wondering, you know, have we done adequate research to look at <coughs> other uh, car share services to see if, in fact, we can find one? Several of them are owned by, uh, you know, large corporations, Hertz on Demand, Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Um, and just trying to see if we can, in fact, find someone that will pay full yeah. value for those parking. So there's three large services, the, the three that you mentioned. Um, there's a, a host of smaller ones. Car to go, I think, is the one in Austin, which is very small, and I believe they're only the Austin market. There were some other ones which actually merged together. Um, but all of them, where if you look at this, the markets they're in, all of them, or almost all of them, tend to be in larger markets. So Zip is unique in pushing the envelope for the smaller markets. Um, and so most of them aren't interested in towns like us. And until recently, they all required free parking spaces. Um, it's really only been as this market has proven itself in bigger cities that they're beginning to willing to pay for, for parking spaces. Um, so I, I, I'm a member of uh, the Urban Sustainability Des uh, Network, whatever it's called. It's a municipal network of sustainability directors. And there's a lot of discussion about car share programs there and what's the market that works. And it doesn't seem from those discussions that markets like us yet demand a premium price yet. Councilor O'Donnell. Um, I have a question about the word renewable and renewable uses. Does that imply in any way that these, the terms of a lease for, say, the previous year could be automatically accepted again for the next year? No. It just means... It means the mayor wouldn't have to come back to you to renew the leases at the end of the term. And I ask that because one of the uh, ideas that came up, and I think it was in Edlu, was in this order we could, in fact, stipulate that we're giving that authority for a one-year period. I, I, we could do that. It would be limiting. I wouldn't want to overly limit the mayor, but, I mean, it would be a way to ensure that we come back in here and say, hey, wait a minute, maybe we should be charging. Two thoughts about that. One is, if you're going to limit it, you probably should limit it to three years, because most places don't want to come in without knowing they could be there that long, um, even though both parties still have the right to cancel if it doesn't work for some reason. The other is totally symbolic. I know you all and trust you all, but not everybody does. And so I think the message you want to send is you may want to revisit in terms of terms and those kinds of things. But not necessarily revisiting. I mean, hopefully, we're committed to wanting car shares out, out there, um, and so I just want to be very careful of that message that's, that's out there. Wait, I, I feel like part of the reason to give them this opportunity is so that they can make sure that they're successful. But they already know they're successful. They're successful at Smith. They're already successful in Northampton. So I, I don't, I don't have any concern that they will be successful. And I still feel like this would be, that this allows for the possibility. Of, um, of free parking um, to, to a company that got sold for half a billion dollars last year. So I do kind of view it as a subsidy. Um, I, I have no concerns that they'll be successful here. They actually are successful here already. Um, and I want to clarify, because it's slightly confusing from reading the order. It says at no cost to the city, and with, but, but the users are paying. This isn't like some free service for residents. You have to, residents have to be part of the program and pay per use. And um, and and so it's not free, and and th this allows the mayor to put reasonable conditions on it, but also allows for potentially free parking. I, I think that um, I, I don't think they need to be in the parking garage at all. For one, we discussed this a little bit um, at, at, at Edlu, and also when when leaseholders are paying up to night, they're paying some ninety dollars a month for for the dedicated parking lot that's only for leaseholders. We've we've given out a hundred of those passes. There are only 70 spots, so users have to use the rest of the garage if and when it's available, and sometimes there's no availability whatsoever. So to, to create a possibility where a half-billion-dollar mega corporation could have free spots in the garage um, that other people can't use, um, that these might not be used all the time, they, 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 they may, may be sitting there just taking up spots that another person could use, um, I just I can't really see it as fair. Um, I think maybe we should consider limiting it to outdoors, mandating that they pay. And I don't understand why we don't put this out to bid. The order states Zipcar. The ordinance does not state any 
particular company? Why don't we put this out to bid and ensure that we're getting paid? Um, um, and and so you know, I'm, I'm I would feel more comfortable with the, the mayor here. Maybe he'll give us some assurances that that um, that well, for one, maybe he would be open-minded considering that they don't need they don't need dedicated covered parking when those those they're not even used all the time necessarily. They could be sitting unused for a period of time, and maybe he'll give us some sort of assurances that um, that they certainly will have to pay. But I mean, why don't we why don't we have them bid? And um, and again, I just don't see it as fair if you're paying ninety dollars a month. I used to have. I had a pass there for twelve years. I no longer do. But there were times where I was paying ninety dollars a month. I didn't get a spot in the entire garage, and I had to pay for, for on-street parking. And um, and so we also have a um, a list so a, a list of people who want to get that passed that's long enough to fill the entire garage. So you know, I I I don't think it's fair to give to to create the possibility that this mega corporation. I got sold for a half billion dollars last year, should have free access to our parking garage. So, I guess this brings up the issue, because we've had these kind of discussions before when there are contracts that the mayor is going to negotiate, whether it's with Smith College or other places. And I basically take the stand of, you, you don't, I don't want to be negotiating a contract with the nine of us. What we're basically saying is we're empowering the mayor to do what's best for the city in a contract negotiation. We can decide, okay, we can put all kinds of limitations on this. And again, I think it's, do we have a desire to have this happen, even if it's for a year? If the contract is really terrible, we can come back and revisit this. But it's the desire to have this. And I guess it's a question of, do we trust that the statements even that Wayne's making and the research on this is that, you know, these companies are not knocking down our door to do this. If they were, we'd have companies coming. If this looked like a good market, what would happen is we would have a lot of companies wanting to be here. We have rental companies here. You know, we have Enterprise and we have these other companies, but we only have a, you know, small number. They're not 20 or 30. We don't have a lot of these share companies, car share companies coming in here. I think in this first year, what I would like to see is let's let the mayor negotiate this in the best way, because I think from what I've heard, most people want this to happen. If we look at this after the first year and we say this was not a, something we, we think was a good deal, we can come back and, and look at this again. But I would like to see this take place. And again, look at what they're doing. They're coming here with initially two cars. So it's not, it's not a big operation we're talking about. Council Sierra? Wayne, is there, is there an inherent advantage to using Zipcar versus putting out to bid or trying to find another company because Smith already uses Zipcar? Can, are those cars somewhat going to be, the six there and the two here, somewhat interchangeable? So it's now a team of eight cars. That's exactly right. What you'd like to have in an ideal world Fleet. is a that's network. That's what I was looking for. You'd like ideally a network where each car is maybe 500 feet away from the next car. So I'm a member of Zipcar. And so I typically get my car from the parking garage. And so far, there have always been cars there. But if I couldn't, I could then go to the next site on campus for cars. Um, could we park like a car, one of our city cars? Could they be parked at Smith? If so your membership would be. So you have a you have a, a membership card. You can now get an app for your iPhone or you know whatever your phone is, and I can be saying, oh, I suddenly feel like going to Detroit tomorrow, and I can you know sign up quickly and and get a car, and if the cars are gone downtown, I can use them there, as opposed to having to be members <coughs> of different groups. So there there's certainly benefits for doing that. That said, if both you know if Zip and Enterprise want to come in town. The whole reason for asking for six spots is we could potentially accommodate both of them and, and let them grow. Because, you know, on the one hand, Zip is more mature and so it's going to meet more needs. On the other hand, of course, we want competition, so we want Enterprise to get a chance to come in. We want Hertz to get a chance to come in. Councilor LaBarge. Um, my question is in economic development, housing, and land use, Council <coughs> Inspector. Was the mayor there and talked about it then? No. no. What, I'm sorry. What, he Wayne did, Biden was. Didn't he come in? I thought he came he, in briefly. He he was present for the uh, round discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I thought he weighed in yeah. briefly on it too, but maybe I, maybe I missed remembering it. Councilor yeah, O'Donnell. Um, I, I think the trick of this is this is um, a private company that's <laughs> providing a public benefit. It, it's sort of like a cab company in a way. Except you, you drive your own vehicle. You're not driven around. Um, I sort of feel those things are comparable. So my question is, when we give licenses to like 
last month we gave a pedicab license out, I think, for one of the first times. How long a period do we give that license out? I mean, did the city council stipulate, okay, you have this license for this amount of time? Because maybe that's not unreasonable to do for a zip car. On that point, I, I think it's different because they're allowed to, they don't need to be, they don't need to take up a spot necessarily. But to the point that it's similar to a cab, if I were a cab company, I would think this is extremely unfair because, you know, Funky Cab or whatever other cab doesn't have this opportunity. They're, they're totally excluded from the definition of this, and they do provide a similar public benefit, as Councilor O'Donnell pointed out. And they employ local people. And this zip car is going to, it's not going to employ anybody or maybe, you know, one or two people to come move the car occasionally. At least that's what this was discussed in Edloo. So, you know, th this is not something that employs people, unlike taxi cab companies. And, and when you can make that comparison, I think it makes, I think it's, um, we see that this is unfair. Councilor Carney? Okay, thanks. I'd just like to bring it back to what the order is. Mm -hmm. And the order is whether we want to authorize the mayor to sign renewable leases. Um, and again, as Councilor Spector said, so we're, we, whether we want to defer to the mayor's judgment in these and negotiating those leases, it doesn't say with Zipcar. It does say, and so, and the mayor isn't here tonight to ask those questions that a lot of us have asked. Now, we could either table this or we could pass it in first reading and then with the request that the mayor certainly be present to answer those questions in second reading. I think, um, but uh, are those, those are our options. If we defeat it, it's gone. And the mayor will no longer have an authority at all to negotiate a lease around shared vehicles. And it sounds like this is something at least that has been in the works for as, for as long as I, I can remember this going back at least six years when Zipcar was yeah. first coming to the city. So, and again, I just said Zipcar, but we brought uh, all, it, there's no mention of Zipcar in the, in the order itself. And those are some very um, important questions that we would ask the mayor in terms mm -hmm. of what kind of market research, what kind of, you know, and whether we want to allow the mayor to actually engage in that, in that work or not. Just a point of clarification, Zipcar is mentioned in the order, but not the ordinance. Um, order. Yes. Councilor Barge, Councilor Klein. Right. I like the idea um, with Councilor Spector and Councilor Carney. In regards to, yes, the mayor is not here, but I think that we should do the first reading, ask the mayor to be here so that we can go ahead and bring forth the concerns that we have about the ordinance. Councilor Klein? I'm just wondering if, if there's any detriment to amending the language a little bit to um, emphasize the um, priority for not offering the free spaces to this uh, company that was just purchased for half a million dollars? It, we did change it in ordinance if it, the free is gone. Right. The, the, amended, the amended language is here that says may lease, free is, strike, is, is stricken. I don't know if we're seeing the same. Yeah. Can I, yeah. I mean, can I, yes. um, I can make a suggestion that um, that for consideration that the mayor finds reasonable. That way it's mandated to be something, but he can determine what that is. But, I mean, because with this language, he can determine free to be reasonable for a period of time. Well, free's uh, gone in the language, just so we know. We're not looking no, no, what I'm saying is finds reasonable. He could determine free is reasonable for a period of time. And <coughs> because it requires that he, that it, terms and conditions that he finds reasonable. Are you making that as an amendment? Because I would second that because I think what that's basically in the <coughs> spirit of this to saying we authorize the mayor to negotiate. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll Are you looking at the language that already has the strike through in it? Because we amended this in ordinance. Is that is that does that have <coughs> the strike through already in it? This I, I believe it's the it, you can see if it has the strike through in it. Oh. No it uh, no it doesn't. Wait a minute. It's not the is authorized to sign. Oh, I see. And ours has it. Yep. Okay. So you could amend that further. Where? Yep. Yeah. Okay. As I'll, long as I'll move. Um, and other terms and conditions for consideration as the mayor finds reasonable. Second. Is there any discussion on the motion? I I, I don't understand the distinction. What, because the the. the the way it is now, it's simply that, that, that for whatever the mayor determines to be reasonable, mm -hmm. he could put as a condition. Okay. 
Understand. Given this language, the mayor could determine that free is reasonable, given the particular situation. The, the council, how is that different from what it is now? Right. When I when we add consideration, that means that there must be payment. Payment that he considers reasonable. That's what I'm trying. That's that's what oh. the intent of this. Where? Well, that's what you mean by consideration. Right. Like yeah, con contractual. Could <coughs> be zero. So a dollar could be reasonable. Okay. okay. But zero is not, so zero is taken out of the equation. Uh, what that, consideration is, would zero? I'm, I'm just looking for a dollar. Right, right. Okay. But right now it does allow, it allows for, it allows for zero ad infinitum, and what you're saying would allow for one dollar ad infinitum. So I don't really see the difference in that language, <coughs> if it's either zero or to whatever high amount or one, it seems it seems it doesn't add all that much okay. to it. Yeah, we have other it's options. Just to do the whole, I would actually rather wait for the to hear. I would rather table it actually and hear from if there's going to be that much. If there's that much right. discomfort around this, I'd rather table it and talk to the mayor. All right, um, I'll, I'll withdraw my motion. Sure. Um, is there is there further discussion? Yes, I have a question. Is there any problem with table with tabling? Is there any time pressure on this? Um, only in that there are benefits of getting this in place by the summer when we, we get more visitors down to to do that. So I, I would like to, be, this again, I go back to the second reading and that this is why we have it. Questions come up. I think the mayor comes. Yeah. If he doesn't satisfy that, we vote this down, you know, or we change amend it, it right there, or amend it then. So I'd be happy to move this. I would support moving this forward. Councilor yeah, I, I, I guess my preference would also be to pass it or consider it now for first reading rather than table it. Um, because then we still get a breather, but yet we move it forward. Just a question about the language here. So um, looking at the ordinance, it says, the mayor may lease parking spaces and associated signage. Mm -hmm. So lease doesn't necessarily mean that there would be some cost associated with it because free has been struck. Yeah, we asked, we asked this of Carolyn when she came to the ordinance committee and it was her, her opinion, she's not the city solicitor obviously, but her opinion was that the language as amended would allow the mayor to lease for zero or for one or two ad finitum. Mm -hmm. And that that's what this language allowed for any, mm -hmm. any figure that the mayor deemed appropriate in the negotiations. So this language doesn't really change anything, even though it's struck authorized free. Yes, because originally I think the I think it um, yes it, it doesn't what it does is it says it allows open the possibility that it would be free or for money. When I think originally the discussion was that it would automatically be free, but there was enough concern that was raised either in Edlu. I think that's where the concerns were raised. That and it was probably you, Councilor. Clark, I'm not really sure, but. There's enough concern that the, um, the language was amended such that it wouldn't, it wouldn't specifically say free, but instead would say lease, and then it would be up to the mayor whether that would be for free or for remuneration. Mr. Fudd? I, I have spoken to the mayor about this. He, he's absolutely intending not to be free to charge something for it. I think that something is still what he's exploring in a negotiation, and I threw out the 50 or $60 a month per space as what we believe the market is. Um, so I wouldn't hold him to that, but that, that's still, you know, $100 a month times 12 months is real money. It's not huge amounts. So I'm sure he's trying, I'm sure he's committed to your, your for consideration or something like that would have been fine from his standpoint. Second. Motion made and second to call the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Roll call vote. Councillor Adams? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Sierra? Yes. Councillor Spector? Yes. Uh, yes. Councillor Klein? Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Passes on first reading. Uh, if there aren't any objections, I'll take orders five, six, and seven, which are all related to parking, uh, as a group to refer to the committee on rules, orders, appointments, and ordinances. So Second. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? 
Are there any updates from committee chairs? Oh, we have to do the skip the order. Skip the ordinance. Yes. Sorry. Oh, yeah, Thank we, you. Yeah. We did the um, so the I skipped the ordinance that we just discussed the order, but we kind of encompassed both. But um, ordinance number number four, ordinance. Amend section 312-36 parking meter locations and regulations, private shared vehicle services. Is there a motion on first reading? So moved. Second. Moved. Second. Um, is there further discussion on this? Oh, just to just to point out, does the, the record say that we we want very much the mayor to be present at the next meeting to answer the important questions? And just I'll just say that um, if I might not support if we're not guaranteed consideration. I also think that consideration should be at least what what a what a um, a person with a pass would be paying monthly. We're voting on the, the ordinance. ordinance. The Basically, ordinance. the same thing, but put oh. into okay. the, the ordinance itself. So, roll call vote, please. Councilor Carney. Yes. <laughs> Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Chair. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, so are, are there any updates from committee chairs? Information requests, new business. Just a, a statement. I don't know, but but an amazing job by our yes. city Thank clerk you. on her first <laughs> night. What a smooth transition. And our council vice president. Thank you. Very yes. nice. Yeah. Is there a motion to adjourn? So, so, so <laughs> we're going to stay. Because Tammy had good training. Aye. 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 So clerk. <laughs>